Hashem, Hashem, Nasev, and Atzliach, Shiur Torah, Baruch Hashem, good to be back. Sunny Isles, Florida, we are starting a new week, Bezat Hashem. We have our uh, Sunday Shiur about uh, the Bitachon series. Baruch Hashem, we're up to, I believe, number nine in the series. Whoever does not have one of these little booklets from the Beta Levi, uh, please uh, get one from Michal if she still has any extras. That way you can follow along a lot better than... Uh, Traditionally, just uh, off of memory, and uh, which brings me to my first topic that uh, I recommend to people all the time that are watching the shulim. Whether you're watching it here in front of me or you are, I have one more here, one more extra. Maybe check in the bag. Uh, whether you're um, watching in front of me here, Baruch Hashem, the uh, no, the uh, first compartment over there. Yeah, should be maybe some there. Nothing? Check any of the compartments, maybe you'll find something. Whether you're watching in front of me or you're watching uh, online, Baruch Hashem, most of the uh, views are online. Hashem has mercy on us. He knows that uh, we need uh, to reach a lot of people, so He created the Internet. And Baruch Hashem, as of now, just one of our channels, I looked at the report today in the last 28 days, has almost a million minutes of uh, people watching in the last 28 days. If you include uh, Facebook and uh, the other channels, Baruch Hashem, we're probably approaching somewhere in the neighborhood of two and a half, maybe three million minutes per month that uh, reaching people to watch Torah. I mean, if you do the math of how many mitzvot a person gets uh, for, for learning Torah, how, what, what he gets for it, what is a person that actually sponsors it, invests into it, I mean, it's a, uh, there's, no, there's no accounting for it, especially when a person learns something and applies it to their life. You know, you learn something. If you learn, uh, let's say you uh, take one of the uh, psychology books I used to study when I was a kid, around your age. There was a very uh, famous, well-known psychologist uh, named Freud, Sigmund Freud. And uh, he had all types of strange theories about everything had to do with an obsession with your mother meaning every type of mental, demented thought that you had had some type of connection to the fact that you're obsessed with your mother. Not obsessed like you love her. Obsessed like Hashem Echem, like you want to be intimate with her. This is Sigmund Freud and Hashem Echem. That's what happens when a Jew uses his mind, not for that Torah. Instead of doing Torah, they do the opposite. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Avraham Avinu. Your descendants are going to be like the stars or the dust. So the Chachamim say, what do you mean the stars are the dust? If he meant, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu was making a promise, was making a prophecy to Avraham Avinu in regards to number, meaning that your descendants will be very numerous, then why say the stars and the dust? Because they're both very numerous and, you know, something that we can't count. Obviously, there's a more significant meaning behind the scenes. So the Chachamim say, what do we learn from here? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling Avraham Avinu already before Matan Torah, he said, your descendants are special. Your descendants are Am a, uh, a nation, a stubborn nation. If they follow the Torah, they will be greater than the great. They'll be better than anybody else. They'll be like the stars among creation. If they don't follow Torah, they're not going to be like everybody else. So for all of those people that are just trying to fit in with the Goim, you cannot fit in with the Goim, even if you want to. Why? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu put into you a piece of Him. Uh, put, put into you a neshama that is incapable of being like a goy. You could think you're a goy, but unfortunately what happens to a Jew when he tries to act like a goy is he becomes worse than the goy. And that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Avraham Avinu. They're either going to be better than everybody else, they're going to be a light to the nation, or they're going to bring darkness to the world. People like Sigmund Freud with his demented theories, or Karl Marx, with this whole communist theory that brought so much death to the world, you would think, why do they se still celebrate this person? China, China has statues all over China. In Germany, they have statues of Karl Marx, a Jew. They don't tell you that he converted to, to Catholicism. They tell you he's a Jew anyway. Because in their eyes, there's no such thing. It's like Torah. Torah says there's no such thing as a Jew that converts to other religion. It just means that he's a Rasha. He could practice another religion. He's just going to go to Genom for longer. But as far as, as far as him converting to other religions, no such thing. You cannot take the Jew out of a Jew. Impossible. Meaning, a Jew that does not follow mitzvot 
is simply judged as a wicked Jew. Even if his dino is like a goy, even if he's judged like a goy, when we say that a mechalel Shabbat, that a Jew that violates Shabbat, is considered like a goy. Not that he's considered like a goy, that now he only is obligated to keep seven laws of Noach. Meaning that when it comes to laws, when it comes to mitzvot, we cannot consider him part of the nation. Meaning that if you're going to have a wedding, you need two witnesses. These two witnesses have to be kosher witnesses. If one of the witnesses is a Jew that violates Shabbat, he cannot be one of those witnesses. If your wedding had two Jews, two witnesses, but one of them is your father or your uncle or your brother or whoever it is, but he happens to be a Michalel Shabbat, guess what? Your wedding is null and void. Your wedding doesn't count. Every time you touch your wife, you're touching the nida. You have a very serious problem in your hands. Why? Because a Jew that doesn't uh, keep Shabbat cannot be counted as a witness. And this is the same thing when it comes to law. When somebody goes to a Bedin, they need witnesses. If the witness is a Mechalel Shabbat, we cannot use him. So it's not that we consider him a Goy. He's always going to be a Jew. He's just judged as a Goy when it comes to Allah. Now, why do people... Why do people... Uh, why do people do such strange things where they ask Hashem for blessings, they ask Hashem for all types of wonderful things, they tell you they believe in Hashem, but the way they live their life is against Hashem. They say, I love Hashem, I love Hashem, they start singing, you know, whoever believes is never afraid, or Akadosh Baruch Hu, we love you, and they start singing with all their friends while they're doing a uh, mingle, they do a barbecue on Shabbat. How come? How come? This all starts a Botaye Karim with a small, tiny little germ. Tiny little germ that's so insignificant, so small, you can't even see it with the naked eye. You know, years ago, if you look at history, there was a plague in Europe. There was a plague in Europe. They called it the Black Plague. Why are they called the Black Plague? Because anywhere this plague traveled, all it created was black, meaning death. The estimates say that somewhere around 90 million people died from this Black Plague. Meaning, just imagine, imagine your worst dream, this is worse. You have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 400 million people in America. Imagine a quarter of them died. And they're all on the streets because there's not enough equipment or resources or even, or even time to bury all the bodies. So meaning everywhere you go, there's walls of bodies everywhere. There's not a hole that there is no bodies. And what happens? Body is there, that means the disease is there. The disease is there, most likely, whoever's around is going to die also next. Now all of this disease... Start with what? A tiny little germ that you cannot even see with the naked eye. You can try as hard as you want. You're never going to be able to see it. You're never going to be able to see it. There was also another germ that killed many people, not as many. But Torah talks about it. We call it today AIDS. And this germ killed a lot of people. Now, if you look at this germ with the naked eye, you're not going to be able to see anything. If you look at it, it's whatever the, this germ is on top, you're not going to be able to see it. If it's on the floor, you'll see the floor. If it's on somebody's head, you'll see the person say, you're never going to be able to see the actual germ itself with the naked eye. But yet it kills. Yet it destroys. Try to go behind the camera, not in front. Behind the camera, Motek. Behind. Yeah, that way. The other way. The other way. The other way. There you go. Chatzadik. There you go. There you go. Oh. No, no, they want to look at me, not you guys. <laughs> they said uh, they can't handle such good-looking people, so they have to look at me. So they, people, people watching on the internet, they say, listen, we don't want to benefit in this yeah. world. There's so many good-looking people in your crowd. If we look at them, they're not going to give us Gan Eden. They say, okay, we'll look at you. It's kaparat avonot. It's like, a, it's like a punishment to look at me. But what's he going to do? We all have to get our punishments. Now, Rabotai Karim, this little germ, this little germ is very dangerous. This little germ can kill a lot of people even if you can't see it. But there's also, Rabbi again, Allah Shalom, had many lectures about this. He says there's a spiritual germ. There's a spiritual germ that Chazal talk about, Shlomo Melech talks about. All over the Torah talks about it, but yet, if you go on the internet, you're not going to find that much material about it, which makes it more dangerous. The germ is called laziness. 
That's the joke. Shlomo Amedach says in Mishle, Proverbs, chapter 19, verse 15, Atzlat Translation, laziness casts unto cast one into slumber, and deceptive soul will go hungry. Shlomo Melech says, laziness is going to make you tired. Usually you would think the opposite. Because I'm tired, I'm lazy. Right? That's what people tell me. Listen, I tell them, why don't you read a little bit? No, no, I'm tired. Why don't you uh, watch a shoe at least? You don't have to, you know, it's not that hard to watch a shoe. Just press play. That's the most you can do. That's it. Press play, oh, but it's three hours. Okay, don't watch the whole three hours. Watch two hours. Oh, it's two hours. But if it was X-Men, you'd watch the whole two and a half hours and say, why it's so short? I said, okay, so don't watch two hours. Watch one hour. Ah, two, one hour. Who has one hour these days? I said, okay, kapara. Okay, okay, it's okay. Descend. Don't worry about it. We made a special list for you. A special playlist which is short clips. We take the best of each lecture, do 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 15 minutes, 5 minutes, 6 minutes, press play. Okay, can you do 5 minutes? I can do 5 minutes. You ask him a week later, so did you watch the clip I sent you for 5 minutes? Ah, I didn't get a chance to. You have 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You didn't get a chance to watch a 5 minute clip? How? How could that be? Shlomo HaMelech is trying to tell us, you have a germ, you have a disease, and you don't even know you're sick. It's called laziness. But not laziness like you don't feel like working. Because if you tell the guy, listen, I got a deal. You know what? I'm going to go back to Wall Street, Chas Shalom. I'm going to go back to Wall Street, and I'm going to start a firm. I'm going to hire all you guys. Because my firm was full of guys like you, young kids, that had a lot of ambition. All you wanted was money. I had My whole firm was full of you guys. So I'm going to start a new firm right down the street. Each one of you guys, day one, you can start working, making money. Everybody, all of a sudden, is ready to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I tell you to go to school at 6 o'clock in the morning. What, are you crazy? 6 o'clock in the morning? This generation? 11 minimum. Why are you at 6 o'clock in the morning? I don't go to sleep till 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm on the internet. I'm playing uh, games. I'm watching movies. I share what I'm doing. But if I tell you, come work on Wall Street, 6 o'clock in the morning, sharks, every one of you, with a tie on. With a tie on. No one shows up with shorts and a t-shirt. Everybody with a tie on, because that was the attire. If you didn't come to work with a, with a tie in my office, you were sent home. Yeah, but it took me two hours to get to work. Okay, so next next time, you'll remember that it's not worth traveling four hours just to be sent home. Next time, wear a tie. What do you guys think? It was, it was cookies to work for me? You think it was fun and, fun and games? If you talked the wrong way, you were sent home. If you were late by one minute, you were sent home. One minute. Eight o'clock, you're supposed to show up to my office. You show up at 8, 8.01. Guess what happens? You go home. Why? If you want to be successful, you have to be disciplined. But successful in anything in life. For some reason, people understand this. After the first punishment, people understand this. Most people that are normal understand this. And from now on, they wear ties. From now on, they come on time. From now on, they don't ask too many questions. They do what they're supposed to. But when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to Abu Hashem, to serving of Kadosh Baruch Hu, for some reason, we don't get it. We don't get it. Why? Because the disease of laziness doesn't exist when it comes to work yes people don't want to work they want to make money right away but in general if they see opportunity they come work where well, there's many seats over here I don't bite you can have a seat over here oh yeah yeah there's three seats over here don't worry I don't throw anything it's fine and even my saliva won't reach that way so when it comes to work, we don't have the same laziness. Yes, yeah, sometimes we're lazy. Sometimes we don't feel like doing this and doing that. But in general, if you see enough opportunity, if the guy says, listen, well, I was paying you 50 bucks a day, I'll pay you 100. All of a sudden, you start whistling at work. <laughs> you're happy at work. You were miserable five minutes ago, but the guy says he's giving you a raise. All of a sudden, you're happy at work. Why? Because you see the opportunity. When it comes to Avodot Hashem, unfortunately, we live in a generation of ignorant people where most of us do not understand the opportunity. Not only do we not understand the opportunity, we do not understand the risk of missing the opportunity. Now being on this side of tshuva, where Baruch Hashem, we try to do tshuva every single day, and Be'ezrat Hashem on all of Am Yisrael, I see things a little bit different than most people. Number one, because Baruch Hashem, we're already doing tshuva. And number two, because I meet a lot of people. I hear a lot of stories and time after time, I hear the same thing over and over again. It's the same excuse, the same disease, over and over again. 
You ask people, did you watch the shiur? No, I didn't get a chance to yet. You ask people, did you, get the, did you read the book that I sent you for free? You didn't even have to buy it. Did you get it? No, I didn't get a chance to. But you asked for it. Yeah, you asked. I asked for it. You got it. Yeah, it cost me 50 bucks. Yeah, I know it cost you $50. So did you read it? No, not yet. I didn't get a chance to. Why not? I was busy. With what? I'm not really sure. People are not really sure what they're busy with, but they're always busy. They're busy with stuff. They're busy with their skateboards. They're busy with their Game Boys. They're busy with their computer. They're busy with their WhatsApp and Shmatsap and all the other. They're busy with everything else except Abu Dhat Hashem. How come? How come we're like this? Now all of us can generalize the whole thing and say, Yetzirah. Yetzirah, we blame him for everything. But the Zohar Kadosh says, the Zohar says, sometimes the Yetzirah goes on vacation. Yeah? Sometimes the Yetzirah goes on vacation. He says, how come people still sin? He says, ah, that's a good question, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says. He said, little last week. He says, it's a good question. You ask, why do people still sin if the Yetzirah went on vacation? How come they still sin? He says, because people fall in love with the sin so much, the Yetzirah doesn't even have to help them sin anymore. Meaning, they're sinning without the Yetzirah. They just like it. They like sleep so much, they oversleep on purpose. They got up at 6 o'clock. They got up at 7 o'clock. But they say, you know what? what I'm going to go to Minyan right now. Who has time for Minyan? Hashem, I'll, t- I'll talk to you at 9. I'll talk to you at 10. 11, maybe, Hashem. Just, just make sure you wake me up. Give me an alarm. What, the shiul? What, the shiul starts at 9? Okay, I'll show up at 10. I'll show up at 10. He doesn't start late anyway. I'll watch it tomorrow on YouTube. I'll watch it on Facebook Live. I'll watch it in, uh, next week. I'll watch it when I get a chance. Oh, I'll watch next week. He has no shiurim anyway. The Yetzirah goes on vacation. Why? We start falling in love with the sin so much, the Yetzirah doesn't have to bother us anymore. This is a very dangerous situation. And it all starts with the same germ of laziness. What type of laziness? Specific type of laziness. It's not laziness to work and make money. It's not laziness to procreate and bring children to the world. It's not laziness to eat because no one's ever lazy to eat. Everybody always has an appetite, even after you just ate. There's always room for another cookie. It's not laziness like that. What kind of laziness is this? It's spiritual laziness. It's specific laziness, Fa'avodat Hashem. Specific laziness to serve Hashem, to do what you're actually supposed to do, to do what you were created to do. That we always have laziness. And that's what Shlomo Amedech says, this laziness brings on the tiredness. It's not the tiredness that brings the laziness, it's the laziness that brings the tiredness. Meaning, you're only lazy, you're only tired because you're lazy. Meaning, guy says, listen, you want to go to Shiul? Oh, come on, Shiu, 9 o'clock, that's ah, late. If he was doing it at 7, I'd come. If he was doing it at 7, I'd come. Okay, you're not coming? Okay, I'm not coming. Five seconds later, somebody else calls him. Listen, we're going to a bar. There's going to be some girls there. Psh, you know what? I was waiting for your call. All of a sudden, he's like a bull. All of a sudden, he wants to go to the club till 5 o'clock in the morning without even sleeping before. Shiu Torah, I'm tired, 9 o'clock. What kind of rabbi is this giving Shiu at 9 o'clock? What, is he crazy? Where does he think we are? In uh, Mount Sinai? But to go to the club, to go to the bar, to go hang out with some girls and make some sins, he has energy for two days in a row. Two days in a row. Enough ecstasy, enough marijuana, enough all types of other junk he's going to put in his body. He'll have energy for three days. A few needles, a few pills, a few everything works out after that. But what is he He doesn't realize. He doesn't realize he's going to have to pay the bill for that. What's the bill? The bill is din v'cheshbon, Chachamim say. What's din v'cheshbon? You think Din and Cheshbon both mean the same thing. Din means judgment, and Cheshbon means accounting. So when a person goes to Shemaim, the Muhammad Sechet Rosh Hashanah says, a person goes up to Shemaim, there's a bad Din, and they do Din Vecheshbon. What Din Vecheshbon? What accounting and judgment? I thought they're just going to judge me. He says, no, no, no. Din Vecheshbon. Why Din Vecheshbon? Why accounting and judgment? He says, first we do the judgment to see what sin you made. Oh, you went to the club, you saw some girls, you touched some girls, you know all that stuff? Okay, that's the, that's the sin. Okay, so I get paid for I, I, I pay for that sin? Enough? No, that's just the sin. Then we do the accounting. What accounting? I already did that sin. No. See, you made the sin, now you have to pay for it. That's obvious. You don't need Shemaim to tell you that you have to make a, you make a sin, you pay, pay for it. 
You don't need Rabbi Reuven to tell you that if you uh, violate Shabbat, you have to pay for it. You don't need Rabbi Reuven to tell you that if you eat pig, you eat non-kosher meat, you eat McDonald's, you have to pay for it. You don't need me for that. Everybody knows that. But Shemaim said, the heavens say, no, 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 there's also cheshbon. What's cheshbon? What kind of mitzvah could have you done with the time you wasted on making sins? What kind of what kind of mitzvah you could have done? Oh, you could have learned a shiur Torah. Shiur Torah, every second you listen, you make him a mitzvah. You listen to an hour shiur, there's no number of mitzvot that you can make. One hour of shiur just listening to it, not even not even following it yet. Not even understanding it yet. You're making mitzvot. So in Shemaim, that's the type of accounting they look at. How come people don't do this? Because the spiritual laziness that we have makes us not even look into the reward at work we're lazy until the boss tells us listen what you don't feel like working what if i give you a raise why you're making 50 bucks a day i'll pay you 100 all of a sudden we're ambitious we look at the opportunity it's double what it was five minutes ago and then we go for it in avodat hashem we don't even go for that why because we're so the yetzirah convinces us that it's so difficult to do mitzvot. It's so difficult to wake up in the morning. It's so difficult to learn Torah every day. It's so difficult to watch my eyes and not look at women that are not my wife. It's so difficult to do all these different things. I might as well not even look at the reward. Might as well not even look at it because I'm not going to do it. But the reality is if you look at the reward that you're going to get for even the smallest mitzvah, all of a sudden you want to do it. All of a sudden you want to keep Shabbat. All of a sudden, you figure, maybe, you know what, maybe I can eat kosher. All of a sudden, you figure, maybe, you know what, maybe I don't really need a girlfriend until I get married. All of a sudden, you say, you know what, maybe I can go to a shul to lie at 9 o'clock. Maybe I can do it. But then there's the most important cure for any disease spiritually. Sometimes, even if you look at the reward, it's not enough. Somebody tells you, you learn shul to lie, you're going to go to Gan Eden. Your Yetzirah is so strong, you say, anybody go there and come back? Anybody go there and come back so I can talk to him, so he can show me? By the way, there is. There is many that went and came back. But that also shows that your Yetzirah is very strong. Very, very strong. So for people like that, the Gaon Mivilna says, for people like that, talking to them about reward is not going to cure the disease of spiritual laziness. So how do you cure it? He says, talk to them about punishment. Talk to them about what happens if they don't go to Shul Torah. Talk to them about what happens if they eat pig. Talk to them about what happens if they do violate Shabbat. Why? Because once they realize the punishment, the reward doesn't even matter anymore. Why? The Rabbi Yisrael Misalan says, if a person truly understood what kind of punishment waits somebody that does not serve Hashem, he would completely do tshuva, never make a single sin, even if he knows he's never going to get a reward for it. Why? Just to avoid that punishment. So how come people sin? Because we really don't understand the punishment because we don't learn about it, which is what we try to talk about a little bit. Not every detail, unless you watch the gay Om that we did. But nonetheless, we mention punishment in every single shiu. And the reason why is because this Rabotai Karim is the cure we all need, myself included. Our neshamot have made so many sins in our life that if we don't learn about what happens if we stay this way, we're simply not going to do tshuva. Now in your avodat Hashem, a person needs to know that it's called avodat Hashem. It's called serving avakadosh baruch Hu, but avodah also means work, toiling. Already, Hashem is telling us it's not supposed to be easy. It's work. Work is not supposed to be easy. If you have a job that's easy, there's something wrong with the job. Work is, you may enjoy it, you may like it, you may want to come back tomorrow and do more of it, but nonetheless, work is not supposed to be easy, especially if you want to be successful. So, Hamim tell us that in your Avodat Hashem, if you're going to serve Hashem, you're going to work really hard, you're going to have different moments of weakness. You have moments of weakness. Why? You're going to see, you're going to shul, you keep Shabbat, you keep kosher, but you have a struggle financially. You, didn't, you, didn't, you don't have enough money to pay rent sometimes. Or your wife yells at you. Or you can't find a zivug. You know how many kids I know? 
18, 19, 20, 25, 35, 45, 55, all types of ages, they can't find a spouse. They can't find one. They found one, but they don't like it, so they want something else. I know a lot of them. They send me emails, they send me text messages, they send me the resumes, day and night, day and night, even though it's not what we do. Baruch Hashem, we try to help people whenever we can. People cannot find a shidduch. So they have moments of weakness where they say, listen, I'm keeping Shabbat, I'm keeping mitzvot, I'm keeping kashu, I'm doing everything. But still, I see my friend that's not keeping anything, he has a new wife every day. I see my friend that he's not keeping anything, but he looks healthier than me. He's 50 pounds uh, lighter than me. His wife looks like she likes him. His job pays him more money. And we see all types of things that confuse us a little bit. So at moments of weakness like this, when you see the secular people or even your old self after you do tshuva, you see it. You see an impression where it sounds and looks like it's better to be against Hashem than to be with Hashem. That's where bitachon comes in. That's where having confidence in Hashem comes in. That's where it's important. So the Bet Levi, they took excerpts from his huge work and put together this small little book and translated it to English. And what we were going over for the last, uh, I guess, nine weeks is different sections of it. To Since there's many new people about Hashem today, I'll... Uh, Summarize what we've gone into up to now. So the Beta Levi starts, he says, if you're afraid of something when you don't have to be, that fear can cause the thing that you're afraid of to happen. Like, for example, if I'm afraid of being hot, what's going to happen? The air conditioner is not going to work, so I'm going to have to sweat and melt in front of you on live television. So why does it work that way? Why does the Beta Levi, why do the sages that are geniuses, above and beyond anything we can imagine, why are they telling us that if you're afraid of something, that's exactly what's going to happen to you? Why? He says, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when he wrote the Torah 974 generations before he created the world, that Torah was not just for us. The Torah is for him, meaning rules for him of how to manage his creation. And in that Torah, he says, I have to manage my reward and punishment based on specific rules. One of the most foundational rules of Judaism, where if you do not believe in this, you simply are excluded from Judaism. Even if your father's a rabbi and your grandfather's Moshe Rabbeinu, it doesn't make a difference, is the rule of reward and punishment. If a Jew does not believe in reward and punishment, meaning that the righteous get rewarded and the wicked get punished, simply they're excluded from Judaism. If you want to pray, you have to get a minyan. There's 10 people and he's one of them that doesn't believe in reward and punishment. You can't count them as number 10. He cannot be a witness. This is a person. He's considered like a mechala shabbat. He's considered like having a goy among you. Why? Because reward and punishment is one of the foundations of the Torah. Now, how does reward and punishment work in simple, simple terms? The reward, the Rambam says, is mainly in Olam Abba, in the next world. And so is the punishment. But there are tidbits of it that we get here. For example, if a person sanctifies Hashem's name, does a Kiddush Hashem, does a Kiddush Hashem, he publicizes the Torah in a very good way, he does a big mitzvah publicly, Hashem will reward him in this world, in his lifetime. They'll see a reward for that mitzvah. If a person does chilul Hashem, desecrates Hashem's name, or better yet, if a person even does a private chilul Hashem, what's a private chilul Hashem? A guy wastes seed in his bathroom, in his bedroom. Nobody sees it. Nobody knows except Hashem. He wastes seed. Hashem says, I'm going to punish you for this specific sin in this world. Main punishment that makes it obvious is they lose money. Anytime anybody that invests in a stock market, they wake up the next day, they lost 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, don't blame the stock market. Most likely you have to blame yourself. Anytime a person loses money, first thing they look at is did I waste seed? On purpose, not on purpose, and so on and so forth. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to give you parnasa. I'm going to give you parnasa. I'm going to give you shefa. Shefa is wealth, abundance. But if you're going to waste seed, 
that shefa leaves you. Where does it go? It goes to your children. Which children? I don't have children. I'm not even married yet. The kid is 16 years old. So I'm not even married yet. No. You may not be married. You may not see your kids. But when you waste seed, you're creating them. You're creating the children. And all of your reward goes to them. Goes to these beings that you created that you can't see just like the germ. So there is a reward. There is a punishment. Most of it is in the next world. Some of it is in this world. Now, Measure for measure means that Hashem rewards and punishment based on the deed. If you steal, Hashem says somebody will steal from you. If you cheat, somebody will cheat on you. If you think that you're cute, like some kid on my Facebook said that uh, he posted to his friends uh, over the weekend on Shabbat, Hashem Yachem, Jewish kid. He says he took a picture of himself and I don't exactly watch Facebook, but somebody sent me this, sent, sent this to me to my attention. He took a picture of himself in a gym. He wears a tank top and he's uh, flexing. He says, "Hey guys, watch out for your wives." Meaning he's not going for a regular girl. No, he's looking for somebody that's married. Not enough that he's already. He wants a married woman. Why? He likes married women. Now guess what? He thinks it's cute. He thinks it's cute to do that, right? It's why it's funny, right? But guess what? A few years from now. When some woman makes a mistake and marries such a person, guess what she's going to do? She's going to be the wife that found some cute kid on the internet flexing. That's what happens. What do you think? This stuff happens. Oh, I can't believe my wife cheated on me with together 10 years. What do you mean you can't believe it? Most likely you did it. What do you mean? I've been honest to her. Maybe to her you've been honest. But before you were with her, you did it to somebody else. Maybe even in a previous life. Nonetheless, the way it works is that if you did it, you will get it. In this, in this lifetime, in the previous carnation, and so on and so forth. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that any time you have a punishment, it's a sign for me to wake you up to do tshuva for that specific issue. Somebody just stole money from you? That means that Kadosh Baruch Hu is trying to tell you, you have to do tshuva for stealing. Wait, but somebody stole from me. Yes. They only stole from you because you stole. When? I don't remember. Oh, wait a minute. What? When I was 15, I took $5 from my cousin? Yes. When you were 15, you were considered 100% an adult, according to the Torah. And you stole $5. And you have to give back the $5. Now, you're embarrassed to give the $5? Put it in an envelope. Don't say where it came from. And send it to the person. Now, what if the person ran away? You don't know where they are. Take the $5 and give it in staka for something that's connected to Torah. If you could return it to the person itself, that's ideal. If you cannot return it to the person or the institution, let's say you stole from a store, or you stole from a, a school, or you stole from something like that, you can't do it or lead to trouble. Maybe, for example, they'll uh, sue you. It's not enough that you give it back. So what do you do? You put it in an envelope and you send them a payment. Now, if you don't have all the money, let's say you stole $5,000, and you don't have $5,000, so what do you do? You make payments. You make payments. You put a, a blank check or just cash in an envelope, drop it off, send it off. Or, if again, if you don't know where they are, this person is gone from the world, you don't know where they are, you take that money and you give it in staka. You give it in staka and you'll see a lot of blessings in your life. There's a famous story that happened in New York some time ago, back in the uh, early 1990s. I think it was 91. Breaking news report on the news. They were interviewing a Jewish guy that owned a small toilet paper company. He didn't know that the interview was coming, but they interviewed him and highlighted his business and say, wow, you have such an amazing business. What's so amazing? When you find out the details behind the scenes. So he told the story himself to Jews, not to the news. He says, one time I came to a lecture just like this, and the rabbi said, it wasn't me, it wasn't a rabbi yet, Rabbi said, anyone that has blood on their hands cannot enter Gan Eden. Anyone that has blood on their hands cannot enter Gan Eden. So everybody was relieved. Oh, I'm not a murderer, Baruch Hashem. But then the rabbi continued, blood is damim. But there's also, damim in blood is, means damim in Hebrew. But damim also means money in the Torah. Meaning anyone that stole money cannot enter Gan Eden. Even if they keep Shabbat, 
even if they give staka, even if they learn Torah all day, all night, all that stuff is good. If they stole money and they didn't do tshuva, they cannot enter Gan Eden. So one of the guys got nervous. Why? He's been stealing for a few years. From who? From his customers. Which today is acceptable, apparently. Even among Jews. People think that if you don't steal, you can't make it in life. It's the opposite, by the way. If you steal, you're not going to make it in life. Not this life. Eternal life. But anyway, he says to the rabbi after the lecture, he was embarrassed, he says, Kvod Arav, what am I going to do? He says, what happened? He says, I'm in a toilet paper business. And it's industry norm that every roll of paper is 100 yards. But none of the customers actually count if the roll of paper is 100 yards. So you know, we all cheat a little bit. You know, you sell 100, but 99. You sell it as 100, you price 100, but it's 99 yards. And then I figured, you know, let me try cut a little bit longer. 95. I said, nobody paid attention. I went to 90. Nobody paid attention. I went to 80. Nobody paid attention. But I said, you know what? I started feeling bad. I said, you know what? I'll make a deal with the, you know, my, my Yetzara. What? 85. I sold it as 100. I priced 100, full price. But in reality, I gave them 85 yards. For years, I'm doing it. 10 years, I'm doing it. Bro. 10 years, I'm selling them 85 yards. That means every roll of paper, I'm stealing 15. How do I do tshuva for such a thing? For the Rav, I want to go to Gan Eden. I keep Shabbat now. I have tzitzit and everything. How do I go to Gan Eden now? Rabbi was smart. He says, if you tell them, he goes, hey, hey, Rabbi, I thought you were smart. What do you mean if I tell them? If I tell them right now, they're all going to sue me. I'm going to be put in jail. And I'm going to be in lawsuits for the rest of my life. And I'll never be able to pay them back anyway. Oh, the rabbi said, I know. That's what I was saying to you. If you tell them, nothing good's going to come out of it. He goes, exactly. Oh, now you're a good rabbi. So I love tell him. He goes, no, you have to do something. What do you have to do? He says, let me ask you about this toilet paper business. Is there a lot of profit margin in it? He goes, yeah, there's a lot. He goes, if you sell them the 100, but really you give them extra. You give them 115. Instead of 100, you give them 115. Can you still make money? Can you still make a living? He goes, yeah, Baruch Hashem. We make plenty of money on the paper. He goes, okay, that's what you do. That's what you do. From now on, give them 115, meaning give them extra. They're paying for 100. You were taking 15. So now with every roll of paper, you're making up for the stolen money without them knowing. And little by little, Hashem will see that you're trying your best. And that's what the guy did. And he did it for one month and two months. And the profit margins went down, but nonetheless, he's still making a living. And if somebody wants to go to Gan Eden, they'll do whatever they need to do. So as you would have it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves people that do tshuva. He loves them so much that he shows them open miracles even in this world. After they pass some tests, especially when it comes to the test of money. Because as HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Moshe Rabbeinu, who said to us in the Torah and Sefer Dvarim, the last generation is going to serve the God of wood, the God of stone, but also the God of silver and gold. What are they going to be the four different types the four different types of Avodah Zarah, before Mashiach comes, you're going to have Christianity, you're going to have Islam, you're going to have money, and you're going to have Kavod. People that do mitzvot for Kavod. They want, they want respect. They want to donate only if you put their name on the website. They want to donate only if you put their name on the, on the, uh, on the building. Now, nah, if you're not going to report it, then I'm not going to donate. Yeah, but you know, people need to do, you need to feed people. Okay, so feed them with a plaque on, to, you know, give them a card that says, I gave them the money. That sometimes people do mitzvot like this. And the Gemara says they'll cry when they get to heaven. When they get to Shemaim, they'll cry because all of their schar, all of the reward they got will be spent already in this world because of all the honor they got. But anyway, this guy passed the test. He started giving his customers extra, 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 one month, two months, three months, four months, five months, six months. On the sixth month, one day he has on his door. Sir, there's a TV. TV stations outside the office. What happened? He doesn't know what's going on. Maybe they caught, maybe they discovered what he did in the past for so many years. He doesn't know what to do, but he can't hide. So he goes outside. Sir, what do you have to say for yourself? We just did an industry research on the toilet paper business, and all of the competitors are promoting a hundred yards per roll, but we did an investigation. The average is selling 72 yards. 72, 76, 78, 87, 89. No one is selling even a hundred, even though they market it. Except you, sir. You give your customers even extra. You give them 115 on the average. What do you have to say about it? 
The poor guy, he's not going to tell me I've been stealing my customers and I listen to my rabbi and I'm doing tshuva. Now, what is he going to say? He goes, oh, you know, I love my customers. I love my customers. That's what he says. Guess what? His business boomed. Why? All of the, all of the customers saw this TV, uh, TV uh, you know, special. They say, well, I'm going to buy from this guy, I'm going to buy from that guy. This guy's giving me at least good toilet paper. They started buying from him and HaKadosh Baruch Hu already gave him reward in this world. Why? He did tshuva. Tshuva that's difficult to do. It's not easy to do tshuva. It's not easy to do tshuva for money. But nonetheless, he did it and he got rewarded for it. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you do tshuva, you'll get rewarded measure for measure in this world and the next. But if you have fear of doing tshuva, that's because you fear people. You're not fearing Hashem, you fear people. Sometimes a woman tells me, listen, I listen to Yeshua, I love everything you say. But you're talking about how a woman is supposed to cover her head if she's married. If she's not married, she doesn't have to cover her hair. But if she's married, she has to cover her hair. There's also another exception. If she doesn't have a head. If she doesn't have a head, she doesn't have to cover the head. But as long as she has a head and she's married, she has no two qualifications, she has to cover it. With what? With a mikpachat. With a uh, scarf. So she says, oh, listen, I want to cover my head, but I'm embarrassed. Why? Because the Rebbitson in my local shul, she wears a wig, and she, uh, she doesn't like when women come around with scarves on their head or hats. And they, uh, my friend next door, I put my kisulosh on to show her one time, she called me Taliban. She called me Taliban. She called me like I, uh, what, she, to- she told me, what are you trying to be, Ben Ishchai? You trying to be the Rambam? Wear a wig like everybody else in the world. But you're saying it's not allowed to wear a wig, according to the Rambam, according to all of the Alachot, because the wigs are coming from Abu Dazara, they come from idolatry, and so on and so forth. So, how do you answer a person like this? The answer is in the Gemara Masechet Brachot, at the end of the Gemara. One of the greatest sages that ever lived, Rabbi Yochanan, says to his students, at teachings right before he dies, he says to them, may you fear God, as much as you fear men. Meaning, the only reason why people don't do tshuva, don't learn Torah, don't go all the way to serve Hashem, is not because they're afraid of Hashem. It's the opposite. It's because they're afraid of people. They're afraid of what people are going to think if I start walking around with a kippah. Like these people in Germany, they announced in the news uh, over, uh, over the last couple of days, if you're a Jew, don't wear a kippah anymore. Why? The Arabs may kill you. Instead of increasing the uh, police force, instead of increasing the protection on the Jewish people, what are they saying? No, you know what, you Jewish people, don't wear your kippah anymore. Why? Because the Arabs may kill you. The Arabs may kill you. Out of all the things you said about. Instead of using their brain, what are they using? Something else. Something else. Not a brain, for sure, obviously. So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you're having a hard time doing tshuva, if you're having a hard time doing mitzvot, if you're having a hard time becoming a Jew, not only by action, but also by appearance, it's only because you're afraid of people, what they think of you, peer pressure. And that peer pressure can lead you to Gehenom, and none of those people are going to help you over there. Next, he says, every person experiences times when his efforts are not only don't help him, but they actually cause him harm. Sometimes people start doing tshuva, they start changing, they start putting on tzitzit, they start praying, they start giving tzedakah, but all of a sudden they see that there's problems in their life that they didn't have before they started doing tshuva, and they want to blame God for it. Meaning, they, want to, they say, listen, before I became religious, my life was easy. Now I became religious, all of a sudden I have financial problems, I have marriage problems, I have this problem, that problem. By the way, all of those problems would have happened with or without tshuva. But now that you have tshuva, it actually is worth something. Why? Why is it worth something? Because now, that means that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is accepting your tshuva. You have difficulties, it actually means that Hashem is accepting your tshuva and likes your tshuva so much that He's giving you problems. How does this make any sense? You see, just because you start doing mitzvot doesn't make the sins go away. You still made sins in the past. Whether it's wasting seed, or going out with a goya, or going to drinking and driving and uh, putting other people at risk, all types of sins. 
You don't have to put other people at risk. It doesn't have to be a sin. We actually kill somebody. That's a sin. Sometimes putting other people in danger is also a sin. So now, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I like your tshuva. You're trying to be a better person now. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give you difficulties. Why? Because since those sins don't go away, there's two options to pay for them. One, you could pay for them in Gainom. Each sin, thousands of years of Gainom. Shem Yachem. You don't want to hear what happens over there. It's not fun. Or, I can give you a little problem for two days. I give you a little problem for one minute. I give you a little problem for one month. I give you a little problem for two seconds. That It was annoying, but it didn't hurt that much. So you put all those sins together, it ends up being you have difficulties for a few months. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, that way, I'm going to clean you up from all of your sins. Why? So when you finally arrive to me in Shemaim, you clean like Moshe Rabbeinu. No gain, no, no suffering. You go with Rabbi Akiva. You go with Rabbi, with Rabbi Shemaim Bar Yochai. No suffering at all. Now, of course, you have to pay for the sins. How can you pay for the sins? You have to suffer a little bit. Either there or here. And when a person understands this, what do they do? They say, thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for giving me problems. Why? Because I know you are accepting my tshuva because you give me problems. So now, when your efforts are not working, when you're doing things and it's not working, it's not that it's not working. It's that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to talk to you. You just have to pay attention to the details by looking at what the Chachamim say. Now, when a person trusts in Hashem, he gains both in this world and the next. Why does he gain both in this world and the next? You look at your peers that don't believe in Hashem or your peers that don't follow Hashem. It's not even a statistic. It's just 100% of people are depressed. Everybody is depressed. Some more, some less. Some are depressed to the point that they want to commit suicide. Some are on the way to want to commit suicide. Some just don't really know what the purpose of life is, so they're just depressed, but they don't really know why. Most people don't really see a reason of why they should do, why they this, why that. A lot of people are taking drugs just to escape reality. Whether that drug is Prozac, or it's painkillers, or it's marijuana, or cocaine, or a little heroin, whatever it gives. There's Sifret Torah in the book, in the back. Please don't sit on it, please. And don't talk in front of me, please. If you're going to talk, no, please, fine. it's interfering. Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want you to escape reality. He wants you to deal with reality. How? By opening a Sefer Torah and see what does the Torah say about this. What does the Torah say about this? This problem. This problem of laziness. This problem of uh, violating uh, Shabbat. This problem of Shlom Bayit. The guy can't get... You know, can't get a job. He can't, uh, you know, be happy with his wife. He's not happy with his kids. He can't have kids, and so on and so forth. The Torah addresses everything. So when a person sees that he's doing and he's doing and he's doing and she's doing and she's doing and she's doing, and it's still not working, that actually means that a kadosh who is accepting your tshuva and he's testing you. If you trust in him, you have bitachon in him. You win in both worlds. Why do you win in both worlds? Because the fact that you trust Him is a mitzvah, but even more so, it gives you fulfillment. When you know that your suffering means something, it has a value, and a very high value, all of a sudden, every time you have a little bit of pain, all of a sudden, every time you have a little bit of difficulty, what do you say? Thank you, Hashem. Why? I know you're giving me this to test me. Now, there's a book called Reshit Chochmah. Anybody here ever hear of it? Rashid Chochmah, you read it? You should read it. Fantastic book. Now, they're not allowed to translate it to English. They're not allowed to translate this book to English. You know why? The Yetzirah told them, don't translate it to English. And sometimes people work for Yetzirah. They don't work for Hashem. They work for Yetzirah. They don't want to translate it. But this book, Rabotai Karim, has a story out of this world. The Sufel. Says a story, it's a real story, not like a fairy tale. Real story. He says the Spanish Inquisition about 500 years ago. Overnight, the evil Goim told the Jews, You have to leave. All your stuff you leave behind, all you take is what's pretty much on you. You were a millionaire yesterday, today you're broke. Everybody left there with nothing. A lot of people got killed. Hashem Yachem, what happened? That's why till this day, there are some Chachamim that say one out of every ten Spanish people, people from South America of Latin descent, one out of ten, it's a very good possibility they're actually Jewish. 
and they don't even know it because they could be from those descendants that stayed behind because of fear and they ended up converting to Christianity now there was a lot of people that left and he says in one of the stories there was a tzaddik and his family him his wife and three kids they got on a boat and they started going away unfortunately there's a disease called Kadachat Kadachat I don't know how you say it in English and this disease starts with a tiny little germ that you can't even see starts and people started dying left and right on the boat the captain of the ship said that's it I'm pulling you I'm going to the next beach all of you are getting out all of you getting out and that's what happened pull up to the next beach a lot of people died already the people that survived went on the beach and now the beach was not connected to some resort the beach was connected to a desert that doesn't end and people started walking in the desert and one after another was dying the hot weather lack of food lack of drinking lack of supplies of everything people were literally dropping dead one after another and this Sadiq and his wife and three kids he tells a story he says we started going and my wife was very 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 soft woman very nice woman very big tzaddika but she wasn't used to walking in a desert so literally within a few days she dried up from the Sun collapsed and died Shem Yachem. imagine a husband has to watch his own wife die in front of him Shem Yachem. again no is not even that bad died right in front of him the poor guy He's a tzaddik, so he has to bury her. He's not like the goyim that in the World War II, they saw their friends, their cousins, their everybody die. They just left them on the streets. Jews bury each other. We give respect even for the body. We're not allowed to burn the body like the goyim. You have to honor the body. Because this is something that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. So, in the middle of the heat, in the middle of everything, he starts digging in the desert, burying his own wife. A little more time passes. He starts seeing one of his three kids slow down. Slow down, slow down, slow down, died. Kid number one dies. Stops again, buries the body. Next day, the other two kids die. Shem Yachem. He's left alone in the desert. Now, if you've ever been in the desert, it's like being in the middle of the ocean. You have no idea what's right, what's left, what's north, what's south. You have no idea where it ends, if it ever ends. It seems like the whole world is this ocean. Same thing with the desert. It seems like the whole world is a desert. People that don't know their way around the desert, they don't make it out. In the, in the uh, day hours, it's hotter than Gainom. At night, it's freezing like the mountains. So now... He had a little more power, a little more strength, and he's continuing for a few more days. But after, he collapses. And then he wakes up from his collapse shortly after with his last bit of energy. And you would think that this tzaddik, at this point, you saw your whole country abandon you. Your friends and family die. Your wife, your kids, everything in front of your eyes, everything is death, 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 death. At the very least, what do you think? Yetzirah comes to you says, listen, what you, what were you religious for? This is what you were religious for? Zet Torah v'zet schara. This is the Torah and this is the reward you get for it? She would figure the guy says, ah, it wasn't worth it. Right? That's what you would expect. And this is what the Rashid Tuchma says. He says he's in his last bit of energy. He got up and he looks at the heavens. He says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I know you're trying very hard to take away my Judaism. I know you're trying very hard to test me and make me die a goy. But no power in the world, including your own, is going to take it away. And I swear by your name, I was born a Jew and I will die a Jew. And he collapses. The moment he collapsed, mysteriously, somehow, miraculously, a bunch of Arabs with camels show up and they feel bad for the Jew. They pick him up, they save his life, they take him to a city, and he started a whole family, started a whole new life, and he told the story. How come it happened that way? How come the, the camels and, and, the, and the Arabs and all the, the, how come the saving grace couldn't come a day early, two days early, three days early? How come? Because sometimes the Kadosh Baruch Hu tests us in order to elevate us. 
But in order for us to show that we passed the test, we first have to acknowledge that we know it's a test. The minute he said, Akadosh Baruch Hu, I know it's a test. I was born a Jew, and I will die a Jew. I'm not going to regret even a single mitzvah. Test was over. Test was over. Finished. Done. No more tests. Why? There's no point. You pass the test. You know it's a test. You pass the test. You know the answer. There's no point. That's when the test is finished. So that's what the Beta Levi is telling us that sometimes a person knows that it's a test and he sees the blessing in this world. But even more so, he gets the blessing in the next world because he'll be rewarded for standing up for the truth when it was difficult. Now, the next part, the new part that will continue, it says that when it comes to money, this is the biggest test that people have. And the reason why is because people believe that they work very hard for their money. They work so hard for their money, they wake up early, they go to sleep early, they make phone calls, they lift bricks, they do a lot of things to make money. And most people believe that they work really hard. And they figure that if I work so hard, that means I did it. I made the money. And that's actually kfirah. That's heresy. Yes, you worked hard, meaning you toiled, but you still didn't make the money. Why? Because if you look at your effort versus what Hashem did, you realize that in reality you did nothing. All you did is make a choice. You made a choice to work. As far as your ability, your knowledge, your strength, the oxygen cells in your, in, in, uh, the oxygen in your blood, your brain cells, everything and anything that enabled you to actually work, the customer that you got, the boss that gave you the job, the company, the product, all of those things that Kadosh Baruch Hu created. The only thing that you actually did is you chose what to do with your time. You chose to work. And the Mishnah in Avot says that if a person decides that he wants to work for Hashem full time, by learning Torah all the time, then Hashem promises him that he'll take all malchut from him, that he'll take all of the things of this world from him, meaning all of the obligations that you have of this world, whether it's money to pay bills, money to buy food, money to buy a house or rent a house, all the things of this world, he'll take care of. If a person has 100% confidence in Hashem, bitachon Hashem, he can learn all day, all night, and never worry about money. Does it? Doesn't mean that he'll be Rockefeller. He'll simply live. Some become Rockefeller. Some become very rich. Some know, but nonetheless, Hashem says, if you work for me, learn Torah twenty-four hours a day, you learn nonstop all the time that you can. I will pay for all of your living expenses. But not everybody has this type of bitachon. Not everybody has this type of confidence. People need to know that they're at least exerting some type of effort in order to make some money, to, to rationally work it out. And there's no problem with that. There's nothing wrong with working. As long as you know that all of the sustenance, all of the money, all of the things that are coming from it, are still coming from Hashem and not from your efforts. So the Beit Levi says, when it comes to making a living, in the book of Shmuel, chapter 1, in a, uh, uh, Shmuel 1, chapter 2, verse 7, he says, Hashem makes poor and makes rich. Meaning, anytime you see somebody, or if it's yourself, see somebody rich, don't ever say, oh yeah, yeah, this guy invested in a dot-com, you know, and, and he got out before the dot-com crashed. Or this guy invested in real estate before it boomed in Florida, before it boomed in Vegas, before it boomed in New York, he invested, he got a good deal. Oh, this guy created an app, and it, it exploded, it became a big hit. Or oh, this guy invented some plier, and, uh, you know, uh, some big company. Decide to take it over, bought the ply for him. And that's why he became rich. Saying things like this is heresy. Believe it or not. To think that because he had a specific idea, that he invented something, or he bought something before it uh, went up, before it went down, or he worked really hard, and that's why he made a lot of money, that's actually kfirah. It's actually heresy against Hashem. Why? Hashem is the one that gives you parnasah. Now, what does that mean, really? That means that whether he founded this app, or this plier, or this company, whether he was a broker, or he was cleaning bathrooms, 
whether he was a real estate developer or he was just in a kola learning to all day he would have been just as rich regardless of what he would have done the panasa that he has right now would have been there with or without him working with or without this idea with or without this invention to say that it's due to the invention due to the right timing due to the right things that means that a person is is actually believing that there is a power outside of god that there's an energy that there's something that can create something that's beyond god's ability and that's heresy that's idolatry so that's why the book of shmuel in our tanakh says hashem makes poor and he makes rich meaning whether he's poor whether he's rich hashem made them that way yeah but he tried really hard i can tell you a lot of guys that try really hard every day and they're still broke i remember when i was in a brokerage business there were guys in a business for already 10 15 years before me 10 15 years before me this guy bobby this guy hated me why i was like a reminder that he's a loser I didn't I didn't uh, show off or anything but you know when you're doing well people see it because the the company reports it on the uh, internet and everywhere else this guy is doing great and so on and so forth so this guy was already in the business 15 years before I even started day one by the time I got there I was in the business for three years he was in it for 18 years meaning he was like a veteran at that moment this month a good month for him was ten thousand dollars which is not bad I came in, I wasn't making anything. Within less than a year, I made $117,000 in one month. The owner of, the, of the Raymond James, the big company, called the office. Who's this kid? You mean who, who was what kid? This guy that made $117,000. Oh, you're on. Yeah, he's, uh, he's our new hotshot. He goes, how's, how's he doing it? He goes, oh, he works hard. He goes, a lot of people working hard. A lot of people working hard. What, what is he doing? And then a nice conversation, the CEO of Raymond James, a big firm, public company, 5,000 brokers, sent me a handwritten letter. You know, I get served my, uh, my honor a little bit, a little kavod. Ah, you see, of course, I'm the best. And what happens? I felt great about it. But Bobby hated me, even more than he hated me before. Why? Because he made $10,000 for the month, and I made 117. I'm a new guy. He's in the business for almost two decades. He's in the business for almost two decades. You worked hard. He didn't get the same success. And the room was full of those people. The office was full of those people. The industry was full of those people. There are guys to this day that are in the business for 25, 30 years. And their best year in their career was overcome by one single month of mine. Meaning their best career, the whole average year, they're doing great, 250000 a year, 200000 a year, which is good money. My best month in one career was 1.6 million. So which means that they have to work five, six, seven, eight, nine years to catch up to one month. Of course, that's going to make them hate you. Why? Because they feel like, oh, he made the money. Little did we all know it had nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with my skill. Nothing to do with my speaking ability. Nothing to do with my stock picks. Nothing to do with anything. What did it have to do with? Akadosh Baruch Hu decided he's going to write a check. And he's going to happen to write my name on it. He's going to write my name on it. Now, I thought I did it because I was so good and I worked so hard and I did this and I did that. Bogus. Nothing. There's plenty of guys that are very, very skilled. Very, very smart. Much smarter than I ever was. Much more talented even than I ever was. Until this day, they're broke. I know guys that we did a deal with UPS one time. UPS, you know, the shipping company? So we did a deal with them. We would go to a UPS center once or twice a week and we'd meet their employees. Now, we figured that we're going to, you know, inherit their accounts, do some business with them. I didn't expect to meet millionaires. I expected to meet average Joes that are, you know, I could just manage their 401k. They work for 20 years. They probably have a half a million dollars so saved up in this retirement account. And we'll manage that money. If you get, you know, 100 people that have a half a million dollars, it's a lot of money. I didn't realize what I was walking into. Why? Because everybody looks the same. They were wearing brown. They all look like average Joe blue collar guys. And I'm starting to meet guys that are in UPS for 25, 35 years that are richer than me. How? 
They've been at UPS for so long, they kept investing into the stock of the company before it went public. When the company went public, they made $10 million. $15 million. Now, he's still a UPS guy. He's still driving, making eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year. Now, if you do a salary times 100, you're still not going to get $10 million. So I said, how, how are you so rich? He said, I, I, I put everything into the stock. I put everything into retirement. I said, so why do you still drive? Why do you still drive a UPS truck making $90,000 a year? He goes, it's a good job. What else am I going to do? What else am I going to do? I said, all the money that I have, I invest in real estate. He has 20, 30, 40 houses all over uh, different parts of uh, the East Coast. He has an IRA with this amount, millions of dollars and so on and so forth, but he still drives like an average Joe. I thought he was a genius. I thought he was a unique case, but then he made another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. And there's a bunch of them. Anybody that was there for 25, 30 years has a bunch of money. It was unbelievable to me. So what changed? HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote a check and put their name on it. That's it. Meaning that even though he was a UPS driver, that mathematically should never be able to see that kind of money, that's only because we don't have enough belief in Hashem. We think that we need to make a lot, and sometimes we have to cheat, and sometimes we have to lie, and sometimes we have to do all types of things in order to get ahead. Hashem is telling us, that's your mistake. You think that you're the one that's going to make yourself rich. You think that you're the one that's going to make yourself successful. And that's the biggest mistake you could have in your career, just to even start off, thinking that you're the one that's actually making the money. So then he continues, he says in the book of Tehilim, David HaMelech says, cast on Hashem your burden and He will support you. Hashem is my shepherd, I will not be lacking. Remember that our forefathers traveled in the desert for 40 years, lacking nothing. In all matters that you succeed in business and earn a lot of money, understand that it's not the business that caused your gain, it's the opposite. Hashem decreed that you should earn that much money and therefore the business was successful to fulfill Hashem's decree. Meaning that it's not that it's because of the season or because of the product or because of the idea that such and such became successful. Whether that such and such is Steve Jobs or Warren Buffett or any famous millionaire or billionaire or even your local millionaire that donates a lot of money to the shul or the community. It's not because they're smart. It's not because of their business. It's not even because of their effort. It's simply because the Kadosh Baruch Hu decided to make them rich. Now, one of the difficulties that people have when it comes to money is they always look at money as a reward. Meaning that if somebody has a lot of money, he has a big house, he has a nice fancy schmancy car, he has a boat, he has all types of things, they assume that this is a reward. And that's the mistake. The sages tell us that if a person loses all of his money, he has a huge loss, he should do a blessing, he should make a blessing, thanking Hashem for the loss. Why? Because he is getting a message from Hashem that Hashem says, I took away your money instead of taking away your blood. Meaning, I took away your money instead of taking away your life. Because you made some type of sin in your life. And I decided that I don't want to kill you prematurely. I don't want to hurt you. So instead, I'm just going to take something that's worth life. Which is money. Called Damin. So the Chachamim say that if a person lost a lot of money, he should say thank you to Hashem. Why? Because it's much more worth it. It's much more valuable to... Keep your life and not your money. Because you could always make it again. And most importantly, if you have a lot of money but no life, then it's worthless. But on the other hand, the Chachamim say, and they note it in Yalkut Yosef, in Yilchot Shabbat, believe it or not. It says that when a person makes a lot of money, he comes into an inheritance. Somebody dies, and instead of giving all the money to the dog and the cat, he gives it to him. There was some woman in, uh, in uh, England, I think it was. She died last year. I think she was a fashion designer. She died last year, and she gave something like $150 million to our cat. $150 million to our cat. I wonder if the cat knows how to invest in the stock market. What does this really show you, by the way? What does it really show you? It doesn't show you that she loved the cat. Because the cat doesn't have feelings. It's not like us. It's not a human being. 
Can't say, oh, I love you. Doesn't say that. What does it really show you? It shows you how much she hated her life and everybody in her life. Why? Because with $150 million, you could literally save a country. You could feed countless people. You could build countless things that survive your life. When you give everything to something that's going to die after a few years, that's an animal that can't even speak back to you, obviously shows how meaningless your life was. Now, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, if I give you a lot of money, don't do a blessing. If I take a lot of money, do a blessing. Why? Because immediately you know, I took the money instead of your life. But if I give you a lot of money, somebody died and gave you a big inheritance, you won the lotto, something happened, you got a big deal, somebody bought your company, you just came into a lot of money overnight. Don't do a blessing. Why? It actually may be a punishment. As the Kadosh Baruch Hu says, <coughs> at the end of Parashat Vayet Hanan, Meshalem el sonav el panav la'avido, I pay my haters cash to their face to destroy them. Meaning that one form of punishment that a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives to people in this world is a lot of money. Not always, but sometimes. Why? He says, I want you to do tshuva. You don't want to do tshuva. I give you another message. You don't want to do tshuva. You want to give you another message. You don't want to do tshuva. After enough messages, enough opportunities to do tshuva, I get closer to me. You still don't want to do it. Hashem says, I've had it with you. So what am I going to do? I'm going to remove your thoughts of tshuva. How I'm going to remove your thoughts of tshuva, the Rambam says, he's going to give you a lot of money. He's literally going to give you a lot of money. Why? Because naturally a person thinks, if I have everything, therefore Hashem is happy with me. If he wasn't happy with me, he'd give the person cancer. He'd give them some disease. He'd give them some uh, something, some problem. If everything looks okay, the person thinks everything's okay. And that's why the Chachamim says, if you got a lot of money, since you don't know why you got it, and you don't really know if you're righteous or not, don't even do a blessing. Because why? It's time for you to do tshuva, to double check. Is this a punishment or is this a reward? So, here we see, Rabotai, that the picture is not so clear. Meaning that if you don't learn Torah, it is impossible for us to know what the message really is. So, sometimes people go to a Chacham. They go to a Tzaddik, they go to a Chacham, and they ask him questions. And that's what the Torah says you're supposed to do. Go to a Chacham, go to a Tzaddi, go to somebody that knows Torah, and ask him. Ask him questions. What should I do here? What should I do there? Did I do this right? Did I do this wrong? Ask questions. Why? Because he's going to tell you what the Torah says. But make no mistake. It's not the Chacham that knows the answer, but rather the Torah. And that's unfortunately a mistake that sometimes people make in this generation and apparently in the religious communities, it's become an epidemic where people make their rabbi, dead or alive, into God. They turn him into God. They go to the grave sites and they pray to the tzaddik. They don't pray to God. They pray to the tzaddik. Tzaddik can be Rabbi Shemobo Yochai. Tzaddik can be the Rebbe. Tzaddik can be anybody. And they pray to the tzaddik. No, please, Abenu, help me here. Help me there. Help me there. And now we have a problem. Why? The Gemara Masechet Brachot says that Chizkiyahu, Chizkiyahu was Raul Liot Mashiach. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to make Chizkiyahu into the Mashiach, meaning he was extremely righteous. Almost became the Mashiach. But Chizkiyahu one day took the um, copper, uh, copper snake that Moshe Rabbeinu used in the desert and destroyed it. Why? Am Yisrael sinned. Am Yisrael sinned. And Hashem gave, brought a bunch of snakes and the snakes started biting people. Started biting people, killing them. So then Hashem says, okay, you want them to live? Make this copper snake. Put it on top of the mountain. And if they look at it, I'll heal them. And that's what happened. People looked at the copper snake, and anyone that looked at the copper snake was healed. So now, Chizkiyahu still had this. Hundreds of years later, still had this bronze uh, in the Bet Dash. Still had this. And one day, he decided to destroy it. And the Chachamim said, thank you very much, Chizkiyahu. That was a Chazaku Baruch for doing it. Why? Because the problem is that people didn't understand what happened in the desert. 
they thought that the snake was healing the people. It's not a snake that healed the people. It's that once they looked at the snake, they looked at something physical, they were supposed to look beyond it. They were supposed to see the heavens, the sky, behind it, and remind themselves, oh, Hashem runs the world. I have to do tshuva, chatanu, avinu, pashanu. I'm sorry, Hashem, and then get healed. The problem is that people got stuck on the physical and the material, and they started thinking that it's the snake that healed people. So when Chizkiyahu destroyed it, what is he telling people? It's not the snake that heals. It's Hashem that heals. And that's the mistake that we make sometimes. Sometimes we pray to a tzaddik. It doesn't matter who it is. And that's Avod Zarah. And the Midrash Tanaim to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 3, from Rabbi Meir Baraness says the following. Rabbi Meir, kiven sheyadu Yisrael shama kadosh baruch hu lemoshe egi azman chal yipater min haolam. Nitkabtsu elav kol Yisrael v'amar lo Rabbeinu Moshe כשעוד בינינו היינו כולנו מתנהגים ומשליכים יביאנו עליך עכשיו מי יעמוד לנו? מי יעמוד לנו אחריך? ומי יגדור פרצותינו ועל מי אתה מניחנו השיבם? השיבם ואמר להם אל תפתחו בנדיבים So Rabbi Mevanes tells us a midrash a behind the scenes what happened when Am Yisrael found out that Moshe is gonna die It's not good news Why? The prophet of all prophets, the Isha Elohim, the one that talks to Hashem like a uh, best friend. He's gonna die. So Am Yisrael got into an anxiety attack. They all went to Moshe Rabbeinu and said, Hey, Moshe, well, what's gonna be? Until now, anytime we got in trouble, we had you to rely on. We had you to, to, to depend on. We did something wrong. You talked to Hashem, you finagled something, but Hashem, Hashem forgave us. Now, what is gonna happen? Whose hands are you leaving us? What are we going to do without you? Now, anyone that knows a little bit of Torah, I don't even mean know the whole Torah or the whole Gemara, I just mean you learn Parashat Shavua once in your life. Knows that there's nobody else in the history of mankind from the beginning of the world all the way to the end of the world, even at the time of Moshiach, that will ever be like Moshe Rabbeinu. No one ever saw such miracles, no one ever performed such miracles, no one will be a prophet, even the Moshiach will not be a prophet like Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe is Isha Elohim, Hamash, man of God. That's what Hashem calls him. Not us. Hashem calls him, you're a man of God. No one will ever be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. No one. This is one of our 13 principles of faith. Even if you love your Rebbe, even if you love your Hasidut, even if you love uh, anybody, no one will ever be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Meaning that no, no matter how great your Rabbi is, living or dead, he will never be like Moshe Rabbeinu. That is understood among all normal Jews. If you're not normal, then we have a different shield for you. Usually it's a psych ward. But nonetheless, all normal Jews understand this. No one will be like Moshe Rabbeinu. So now, Am Yisrael comes to Moshe Rabbeinu and says, Moshe Rabbeinu, what's going to be without you? You're Isha Elohim. You're the man of God. You're the best of the best. You're the... What does Moshe Rabbeinu tell them? You would think he says, no, don't worry, Yeshua ben Nun is a good guy, he's a tzaddik also. Ah, oh, don't worry, you have 70 chachamim, the, the tzaddikim, they're good. Ah, oh, don't worry. You have... What does he say to them? He says to them a pasuk from Tehilim, 146, verse number 3. Don't trust and rely on anyone. Meaning, including me. You want a connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Connect to Him directly. Once you actually rely on man, you have a very serious problem. It's called idolatry. It's called Abu Dazara in Hebrew. Even if he's Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu himself is saying, what do you think? Uh, because I'm gone, anything changes? Nothing changes. Hashem is still Hashem. The fact that you relied on me the fact that you are thinking that something's going to change is a mistake. You're making a mistake here. Don't put... He says, you want to rely on somebody? Why don't you first put this somebody to the test? Can they absolve themselves from death? 
can they absolve themselves from their inevitable death can they save themselves from it from dying if he can save himself from dying like i can't save myself from dying Moshe Rabbeinu says what are you relying me on me on one go to the one that decide death or life or, or, or life go to the one that said and created the world that spoke and created the world don't rely on anybody that cannot even save themselves from death if they can't save themselves from death how could they save you meaning yeah of course you have to go to the chachamim of course you have to go to the tzaddikim to ask for answers to know what to do and how to do it but never ever pray to the tzaddikim or the chachamim no matter who they are including Moshe Rabbeinu from Moshe Rabbeinu and unfortunately that's the mistake we sometimes make because of ignorance because of I don't know a passion uh, that's uh, overweight on certain things people make mistakes for different reasons the key is to understand that a Kadosh Baruch Hu wrote the Torah for us to serve him not a person dead or alive if a person serves Hashem he'll never go wrong if he serves a rabbi no matter how righteous that rabbi is he'll always go wrong and he'll have a very very difficult time fulfilling the basics of Torah I don't mean the basics like keeping Shabbat keeping Talat Mishpacha keeping sh- keeping uh, Kashrut that's not the basics yeah it's basics but it's not the basics the basic, I mean, basics understanding that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is the one that's giving you the problems and he also possesses the solution. That when you have a test of Panasa, don't think that you have to cheat or steal or do anything illegal. Just pray to Hashem. You have a problem finding a Zivug? Don't think that you have to do something crazy to go find a Zivug. Just pray to Hashem. Everything and anything you need, just pray to Hashem and you'll get it. I know it sounds overly simple. I know it sounds a little crazy, but it works. And just for the sake of a little taste of how it works on a day-to-day basis, I always tell you guys that if you ever want miracles, just ask me and I'll give you one from today. So, Baruch Hashem, or we'll finish with this point, and then you guys can ask any questions you want. Hashem, after the success of this recent uh, trip to New York, one of the guests at the, the, uh, the lectures apparently works for a school. So she went back to the school and she told them that, uh, Baruch Hashem, it's a very motivating shiur. I really need to be invited to come speak at the school. And the school called me and they invited me to come speak there next week, next Tuesday, Bezalat Hashem in Queens in front of a few hundred high school kids and to try to give them some chizuk Bezalat Hashem to understand that there is there is a reward and punishment in the world but nonetheless it's a uh, it behooves us to go for the reward and not the punishment and tell them the story tell them the uh, interesting things that happen in day to day life and these people all go to a religious school but apparently some of the foundation needs a little chizuk so Bezat Hashem, we're going to uh, to New York next week. We're going to try to arrange a couple of more lectures at night to different places. But as my rabbi told me, the etzara of this last generation is money. It's constantly money. And anytime you mention to people money, all of a sudden everything changes. You ever want to know how strong your friendship is with somebody? Put money in front of you. You'll see how weak it is, not how strong it is. You ever see, you want to see a marriage, how strong or weak it is? Once there's money problems, everything changes. If it's a strong marriage, money will not change it. If it's a weak marriage, money will end it. Money, unfortunately, is a very, very big test for this generation. That's why some of the guys that have been contacting me for the last couple of weeks about the, uh, the cash advance business, they have a big test. They agree and they know that everything that was said is 100% right. But unfortunately, it's still a big test. Why? They now have to replace... $200,000 a year income. It's not so easy to replace that kind of income when you don't have any special skill. Some are even making more. Point being is that money is a constant test. Now, if you preach Christianity, 
or a Christian version of Judaism, which means that you just tell people what they want to hear instead of what Torah says, then money is not a test. Why? People will pay you to give them more reasons to sin. Tell them that they're allowed to smoke marijuana, even though Torah says no. Tell them they're allowed to gamble, even though Torah says no. Tell them they're allowed to cheat, even though Torah says no. Tell them they're allowed to be with non-Jews, even though Torah says no. Tell them a lot of things that Torah says no, but you tell them. Like, for example, this Mirvis guy wrote a book about how we should be toler- tolerant and welcoming of homosexuals. Even though Torah says it's an abomination. In fact, he wrote a book about it. So much so that the rabbi, there's a few rabbis in the UK right now, his Talmidim, that are giving entire lectures about how we should welcome them with open arms and everything is great. And uh, don't even mention it. Like, it's like, oh, they're, they're just like everybody else. And they say, what if he wants to be a rabbi? Let him be a rabbi. Wait, the homosexual, he wants to be a rabbi. Him and his boyfriend want to be a rabbi in a, in a uh, chavuta. He says, yeah, chazaku baruch. I, I saw this video, I want, to, I want to vomit. He says, who are we to tell him what to do? It's not us telling him what to do. It's Torah says not what to do. So Hashem says not allowed to be homosexual. Now, the fact that you have this desire is one problem. To make this guy the rabbi, I mean, that obviously shows, means that you take this Torah and you changed it. You think it's toilet paper. And that's... Or unfortunately, yes. Or unfortunately, some rabbis say that you're allowed to smoke marijuana, especially before you learn Torah. Or they tell you that if your wife doesn't want to go and keep Shabbat and she wants to go to the beach instead, they say, no, take her to the beach with the car. All types of nonsense like this. So people like this, when they call, when they say, I'm going to charge $5,000, $10,000 for a lecture, there's no problem paying them. Why? Because they work for the Satan. Satan pays cash. But now, somebody that actually tells the truth says, oh, can you cover my expenses? Not even pay me. Cover my expenses already. He's like, oh, wow. You want, want to cover the expenses too? The whole plane ticket? The whole... So what happens? So we just stop asking for anything. Why? We don't want the Yetzirah to get involved at all. If a Kadosh Baruch Hu thinks that we need to get the money, I'll send it one way or the other. Mamash, we're testing our Muna every trip, every time. And not only that, we send them thousands of dollars worth of CDs for free. So you're investing. Not, you're not, not only you're not getting paid, you're investing five, ten thousand dollars into the trip. Now, if I still had the millions from the past, this would be a big deal. Huh? Well, well, what do you want? Come on now. But you don't have money to pay rent for one month, and you're still doing it. Why? Because it's a test for yourself. Do you believe what you say, or you're a faker like everybody else? So now they told me, come to New York. I'm thinking to myself, these 200, 300, 400 kids, this may be their last chance to hear the truth. Who knows? If I bring up the issue, listen, does anybody want to pay for my flight? Does anybody want to pay for the Uber? You know, it's not that much money. You know, I'm talking about five, six, seven hundred dollars Not much money. But whatever, if I mention that, that already leaves the door open for the Yitzhah. Why? They're going to say, yeah, of course we could pay it. And then they go to the treasurer. They go to the treasurer. Oh, listen, we need uh, $800 for Rabbi Reuven. Who? Rabbi Reuven. Rabbi Reuven, are you crazy? You're bringing that, that, that crazy guy here? Oh, uh, ooh, why? Because there's always an Amalek in every situation, especially the bankers, especially the ones in charge of money. So that's, that you're leaving that door open. So if somebody says, no, him, no, he said something about the Holocaust, and they'll mistranslate, they misinterpret something that I said at some point over the last thousand lectures, and guess what? Trip's canceled. So I asked my rabbi, and I already, he said, we don't ask for nothing. Guess what? The second we decided this, what's well, Shabbat, we decided this, I get a text message, one of my Talmudim. He says, Rabbi, did you uh, book everything already in, uh, in, uh, in New York? I said, no, we're still working on it. He said, can I sponsor a lecture? Can I contribute? I said, yeah, Baruch Hashem, it costs money, so anything you can do can help. Anything you can do can help. As I'm, like, I'm typing the response, he sends the $1,000, exactly what it's going to cost to go to the trip, without the CDs and everything else. Who says, who did me a favor? First, I'll pay him cash right now. What, you did a favor before me? No. You didn't go to New York. I paid you before you went. Why? That's how Kadosh Baruch works. That's how Kadosh Baruch works. He just wants you to say, Abba, I know it's a test. It's you saying, testing, testing, one, two, three. It's you. It's you, Hashem. I know, Abba, I know it's you. So, I got you. I'm on to you. I'm on to you, Abba. 
I'm on to you, Hashem. I know it's a test. I know it's a test. And you try your best to pass them. You try your best to pass them. How it's going to turn now, what's going to happen after, only Hashem knows, but Hashem knows, Abba Hashem, we're trying our best. Now, questions. A few people just left. They missed the questions part. Go ahead. Mute. No one will turn off the camera, so you guys start questions. Yeah, go ahead. So the Ten Commandments has the first three. First three commandments tell us that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is very strict when it comes to how you serve Him. Meaning that you can't serve Him your way. You have to serve Him His way. So there's several places in the Torah that it talks about something called Yeshuva Dat, where a person has to be focused. A person has to be in a state of mind that, of clarity that they could fulfill the first three commandments of the Ten. That, to acknowledge that Hashem took us out of Egypt, to acknowledge that there's no God other than God, there's no idols, and to also not use His name in vain, like, for example, say Hashem's name for no reason, like saying like Mikey and John and all types of names, and treat Hashem as if He's not Hashem. And Hashem showed us this, what happens when somebody fails. Now, Aaron Cohen had four sons. All four of his sons were extremely righteous. Two of them, Nadav and Aviu, were the best of the best. So much so that the sages say they were in the level of Moshe and Aaron. Meaning the Nadav and Aviu were in the same level as Moshe and Aaron. And they were the best. Tzadikim, righteous, everything is good. But then the Torah says that one day, they were celebrating with everybody else. And they decided, you know what, let's do a mitzvah. Let's go to the Kodesh Kodeshim and serve Hashem. Let's do a special offering for Hashem. Hashem killed them. Why would Hashem killed such righteous people that they're not going out with girls, they're not uh, wasting seed, they're not murdering anybody, they're not doing anything. What are they doing? They're going to pray to Hashem in the highest level possible. And instead of Hashem saying, thank you, what well, he said, he kills them. So Chavim say, why? So there's five different reasons of why Hashem killed them. Reason number one, they had a little drink before they went. Why they have a little drink? Because they want to get drunk. He said, no, we want to be happy. We want to serve Hashem out of Happiness. Why? Because Hashem says in Parashat Kitavo, Parashat Kitavo, we'll see it in about a month and a half. He says part of the punishment is because when you served me, you didn't serve me with happiness. So part of the punishment is because you didn't serve me with happiness. So they know when we serve Hashem, we have to serve Him with happiness to be, you know, happy heart, glad. So you have a little drink, have a little nice little shot, little tequila, automatically you're happy, right? Hashem says that's not the kind of happiness I'm looking for. And if you think that's the kind of happiness that I need, that I want you to be drunk, that you need something physical in order to be happy, Hashem says you've lost your right to live. You lost your right to live. Why? Because you failed all three of the first commandments. You failed even under acknowledging and understanding what your point in the world is, and you actually think that you need anything else but the Torah, anything else but the Torah to be happy. And that's the failure of this generation. Now, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Allah wa Shalom, writes in Igot Moshe that somebody that smokes marijuana for, uh, you know, for himself, meaning not uh, because of medicinal reasons. If it's medicinal reasons, then they have a leniency, assuming they don't have any other option. Baruch Hashem, even people that use marijuana for medicinal reasons have a, uh, because of new innovations, they do have a, uh, a way to use the uh, actual uh, uh, plant without getting high, which is the CBD. They can use the CBD and, uh, and use that for their health reasons, meaning that they get the benefit of the drug or of the, of the plant without losing their state of mind. But anyone that still insists on smoking marijuana, then they're violating the Torah in many, many different ways. And Rav Moshe Feinstein says... That a person that does such a thing would have been judged if it was the time of the Sanhedrin 2,000 years ago, would have been judged to the death penalty. Like a Ben Sore Umore. Why? Why Ben Sore Umore? Because the Ben Sore Umore chooses to be wayward, chooses to be against everything, even though he knows better. He simply chooses to change his own reality, chooses to overdrink, chooses to overeat, and so on and so forth. So it's not that somebody is, uh, you know, it's, it's against his will. 
No one is forcing you to smoke marijuana or take drugs. So when a person chooses to lose their yeshuva dat, their, their clarity of mind, then in essence they obviously don't understand the purpose of the world and they don't understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is literally here. Now if you were trying to apply for a job, and a job is the best job in the world, let's say it's going to pay you a million dollars a day. You're going to work for some hedge fund. You're going to get a million dollars a day. Now, of course, you're not going to show up to the job with uh, you know, underwear and a t-shirt. You're going to show up with your best suit. You're going to show up with your best tie. You may even borrow some money to get a nice suit and a nice tie just to make sure that you look presentable to, in order to get a job that gives a million dollars a day. And when you see the guy, you're going to shake his hand really firm. How are you, sir? How are you, ma'am? How's everybody? And all of a sudden, you speak British. You're like, uh, you know, speak really well, and everything is good. You use all your dots and your E's and everything else, and you have a business card even though you don't have a job, and everything is changed. Why? Because you want the job. You want the job. So you have a business card, but you don't have a job. You have a business card with your name on it, and your cell phone number on it, and your mommy's address, because you still live with Ima. And you have that. Yes, yeah, sir, in case you need me, that's me. That's me. So, uh, what, it's a company? Yeah, it's something like that. I'm an independent contractor. And you're all psyched up. You give the guy the business card, and you speak British all of a sudden, and everything is good. Everything is fine because you want the job. Why? Because you're giving this guy that's interviewing or this woman that's interviewing you a lot of honor, a lot of respect in order to benefit from them. Akadosh Baruch Hu says, "How come you don't treat me like this? I'm in front of you all the time. I'm in front of you all the time. How come you don't treat me like this? How come you don't speak politely?" You don't have cover now when you pray. You don't have the real intention to learn. You don't wait for the answer to be given to you completely. You walk out in the middle of the answer of the question that you asked. How come? Did you really want to know the answer or did you want to find, maybe I could uh, use one of his words to just not listen? How come? Because Abu Taik, we all have a Yetzirah and the Yetzirah has many, many tools. And one of the most dangerous tools that a Yetzirah has is confusion, leading you to become confused. But confused is confused by choice. Why confused by choice? Because you are spiritually lazy. Like Shlomo Medak says, laziness, that leads to tiredness. What kind of tiredness? Spiritual tiredness. You're tired of doing mitzvot because you're lazy. You don't want to find out why should I do mitzvot? Why should I do mitzvot? Ah, it's too much for me. So when a person is spiritually lazy and they don't want to listen to the whole answer, they don't want to listen to the whole shiu, they don't want to do the full mitzvah, they don't want to do all that stuff, they're always going to have the excuse to justify their current behavior. Even though their current behavior is giving them a little bit of a bad feeling inside. They know there's something wrong with it, but they still continue. Why? Because, ah, it's too hard to do tshuva for this one. Let me try to pick an easier mitzvah. Let me try to pick an easier mitzvah. By the way, for all of those people that are in a cash advance business, the law of not being allowed to be in a cash advance business was in last week's parasha for anyone who didn't see it. It says, Et kaspecha lo titen lo beneshech velo marbit lo titen achlecha. In uh, chapter 20, 25, verse 36, Do not take interest and increase, and you shall fear your God and let your brother live with you. Do not give him your money with interest, and do not give your food for increase. I am Hashem, your God. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying you're not allowed to lend Jews money with interest. But he connects Yilat Shemaim with it. He says you have to fear Hashem. What does fearing Hashem and lending money with interest have to do with each other? He says if you want to get out of the cash advance business, the only thing you need is fear of Hashem. That's it. That's all you need. If you're afraid of Hashem, you'll leave the business tomorrow. No questions. No, what if I have a solution? No, what if maybe I could find a different leniency. Maybe I could only deal with this type of client and I could be a discount broker. Nothing. You simply get up, leave. Why? Because you're afraid that God is going to put you in a place that no one can help you. Including him himself. Why? It's his own laws. So all you need to get out of that rotten, vulturous business and any vulturous business is Yerat Shemayim. You have to be afraid of Hashem. Afraid that Hashem will punish you. Not in this world. In the next world. In the next world. And that's the thing that people need to have. If you have Yirat Shemaim, you will have full tshuva. You don't have Yirat Shemaim, you won't have full tshuva. You won't even have half tshuva. You'll have nothing. Why? Because tshuva 
is requires Yirat Shemaim, requires fear of Hashem. Requires fear of Hashem when you're conducting business. Requires fear of Hashem when you're learning Torah. Requires fear of Hashem when you're asking questions. Requires you know, fear of Hashem when you're getting answers. Fear of Hashem is the beginning of all wisdom. That's what David HaMelech says. That's what Shlomo HaMelech says. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself said. There's many places in the Torah that Hashem talks about fear of Hashem. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu needs you to know He's not your buddy. He's not your buddy. He's your father, but He's also your king. If you treat Him that way, you'll have a good relationship with Him. A very beneficial one. If you don't, and you treat him as if you're doing him favors with each, uh, you know, each Dvar Torah that you're learning, with each Shuri that you're attending, if each mitzvah is as if you're doing him a favor, then guess what? You're not going to get very far with your Avodah Hashem. And that's why it's required, it's a required learning for each and every one of us to learn why should we fear Hashem, how can we serve Hashem through fear, and ultimately get to love Hashem. But that doesn't make fear go away. That just means that the love is on top of the fear. It's not that it's either love or fear. It's both or nothing. Meaning you start with fear and then you go to love. Not uh, just love and then fear. Because in order to love Hashem, you have to fear Him first. Anyway, Olatai, we have the next year on uh, Tuesday. We're going to talk about Igeret uh, Ramban, Bezot Hashem, the, um, the, the letter that the Ramban uh, wrote to his son. And then uh, Wednesday we have uh, asking questions. But if anybody has questions now, oh, Chavut, Chavut. Yes. Okay, so the Jewish neshama is a world apart from the non-Jewish neshama um, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, even though He put a piece of Himself in all of creation, there is different pieces to the neshama. And the Arizal goes, uh, goes into it very deeply. It's very Kabbalistic, very mystical, different, uh, different pieces of the neshama. Point being is that the uh, Jew is, in essence, the Jewish neshama is almost... Uh, I guess the best way to compare it is that it's as if it's a different species. So what is it like? Bria. So what is it like? For example, you have a rock. Something that exists, but doesn't move, doesn't have a life, doesn't speak, doesn't hear, doesn't nothing. Unless there's a neshama in it, and then it suffers all day. But anyway, you have a rock. After that, the next level higher is a plant. A plant. Okay, so you have a plant that has a life, has oxygen, photosynthesis, and different types of uh, different types of things that go into it. There are some plants that, if you actually go and you know, I could show you different pictures, there are certain plants that look like human beings. There are certain plants that have uh, image of a skull. Certain plants look like ballerinas, but I'm not like it looks like it's my mom's that. Certain plants look like animals. There are beautiful, beautiful creations in the world that if you never saw it, you should, because you'd see how it's impossible that all of this came from a mistake. Like, you literally see creation that's moving bodies, people, but in a plant form, or a tree. Beautiful things. Or there's trees that bleed. There's trees that bleed that if you cut them, there's blood comes out of them. All types of beautiful things. There's actually a Talmit Chacham. Uh, 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 Sebag, Sebag, he, uh, he has a website called dafyomi.il.com or something like that, slash 430, I believe it is. It's a fantastic, if anyone, if I got it wrong, you could just text me and I'll send it to you. He has a whole write-up of beautiful things in creation, similar to what we have in Rabbi Vimir Cohen's books and things like that, but he has some in English, and uh, he's actually a uh, engineer and a physicist. Like he's not coming from the rabbinical world. He's a scientist. He's, a, he's, the, he's the highest of the highest. He's a serious Talmud Chacham. I don't know. So now, in his uh, website, he has pictures that you've seen other places. But anyway, he has a very nice website that he made. And uh, you'll see different beautiful creations. So the plants, anyone that learns a little bit about plants, it's called botanics, I think. You see that plants actually speak to each other. To other creations, uh, when they actually uh, put a connected a lie detector to plants to test to see if they do anything, they saw that when the plant hears something or even senses something, 
it feels it shows emotion for example one person came into the office and all of a sudden the plant got sad like it showed the indications that it got sad so the guy that tested it said what are you thinking what would you say he goes, no no nothing he goes no no i need to know i'm testing something there's actually research here he's connected to this test what would you think he goes well honestly i just took i looked at your plant i said ah my plant is nicer it's a much prettier plant he goes wow this plant got offended by what you said the plant got offended by what you said there's a book called the world of plants fantastic book and uh it shows different research and things like that anyway plants have a life obviously not the same as ours but if the chazal say in the gemara that if a person was able to hear the language of the plants he wouldn't be able to live and the reason why is because every time you cut a tree you're killing it and the tree is screaming and the gemara says that it's screaming so loud that you could hear its voice until the end of the world one tree here you cut it in america they could hear him in china so what are you gonna say no i'm not gonna use trees anymore okay don't use trees don't use plastic don't use uh you know uh, air don't use animals don't use fruit don't use anything why because everything has feelings you cut a tomato tomato screaming tomato we're not talking about animals like you see it screaming it's like oh and it doesn't like it no i'm talking about the little tomato you made your salad on tomato is screaming his lungs out it's okay, it's okay for you that you're eating it, but the tomato's still screaming. It's not saying, oh, thank you very much for slaughtering me. It's not saying thank you. It still feels. Everything has feelings. But that was why it was created. The tomato was created that way for a reason. The plant was created that way for a reason. The tree was created that way for a reason. Everything has feelings. Everything has a language. When Shlomo HaMelech and the Sanhedrin, when it says that they spoke 70 languages, what does it mean they spoke 70 languages? They even spoke the languages of the plants. They spoke the language of the Shedim, the demons. They spoke the language of the Meshugaim, crazy people, autistic people, uh, people that have, uh, you know, inability to communicate. They were able to communicate with them. It's not just languages, English, Spanish, Italian, and everything that sounds the same. No, languages that are beyond our ability to even comprehend. So now, Hamim say that when you chop off a tree, it screams. When you take a plant, it screams, meaning there's a life in it. There's a life in it. And the more you look into this plant world, you'll see that there is extraordinary, extraordinary beauty in the creation. But that also reminds all of these uh, vegan type people that say, I don't want to eat, you know, a uh, cow or sheep or or even a fish because I don't want to hurt animals and shows them why they're stupid. And what they're saying is kfirah, it's heresy, because you're saying you don't want to hurt the cow because you think that you're more merciful than God. Because God says, kill the cow in a, in a kosher way. God says, kill the fish, kill the uh, lamb, kill it. He says, why? It was created for you. But you say, no, no, I want to be more merciful than God. I want to be more merciful than God. God says, well, you can't. Why? Because you're killing the tomato. You're killing the lettuce. You're killing all the other salad. What do you think? You're not killing them? Just because you don't hear it doesn't mean that it's not causing some type of anguish and pain. It's like these people that are, uh, you know, they, they want a pro-abortion. They pro-abortion. They want to kill little babies, innocent babies, pro-abortion. because they can't see it. Oh, if I can't see the baby because he's still in the mommy's belly, therefore it's allowed to kill it. Why are you allowed to kill the baby? If the baby comes out, you're not allowed to kill it? Yeah, it's murder. Some states actually say it's even not murder if you kill it right away. But when a person, when a person has an abortion, it's 100% murder. Now the problem is that people say, oh, but I didn't see the baby. So what if you didn't see it? Now, when a person, when a person, when a person is, understands, you have the domain, which is the rock, then you have the plant, after the, which is uh, the uh, tzomech, after that you have the living, the living is like animals, all types of animals, you have the cow, you have the horse, you have the dog, all the animals that you see, the animals also have a life, they also have something called nefesh. Nefesh is required for everything to exist. Everything has nefesh. Everything has a part of a soul in order for it to exist. Without it, you couldn't exist. That's what, in essence, you could say scientifically, you want to like draw this up in your mind, if you have a scientific mind, that, that nefesh is what makes the atom spin. Because in reality, anyone that looks into creation sees that 99.9% of all creation is empty space. 
It's just atoms spinning really, really, really fast. And the only reason you see things as solid is because they're spinning so fast. Just like if you saw a, uh, a uh, fan spinning really fast, it looks like there's a single blade, but in reality, there's four, five, or six. Because it's spinning really fast, it looks like there's a single blade. Same thing with creation. It looks solid, it feels solid, because the atoms are spinning so fast. What's causing them to spin? That's the nefesh, if you will. That's the part of the soul that gives creation a living. Then there is humans. Adam, just a simple human being. Not a Jew, non-Jew. He also has something above the, uh, the animal, which is, is called dovel. He speaks. So he's not only living, but he also speaks. Speaks in a language that you, can, you and I can understand. If the cow says moo, to you it just sounds like a noise. But if, he, if a guy says to you, how are you? Then it sounds, a, uh, then you know, it's a human being talking to you. So the dovel has, is a, much higher than an animal because it could serve Hashem to a higher level. It can learn Torah, it can understand, it can comprehend, it can make certain decisions to go against God, and go make decisions to go for God. The animal can't really do this stuff because it works off of instinct for the most part. And the only times that animals go against creation is when the acts of man lead it to. For example, the generation of Noah, the animals went against creation and therefore Hashem destroyed them because the sins of man affect everyone in creation whether it's the rocks the ground the animals the birds the fish the everything and therefore the create the rest of creation started going against the creator also and therefore some also destroyed them so now the person that speaks has the ability to influence creation and then there is the jew the jew has a higher level neshama than anything else in the world but at the same token as i said in the beginning of this you that high level of neshama has a very, very serious, a uh, very serious consequences if it does not follow the law. As the Kadosh Baruch Hu said to Avraham Avinu, your descendants will be like the stars or the dust. If they serve Hashem, they will be greater light to creation than all other beings. If they go against the Shem, they'll be lower than the rock. They'll be dust. They'll be lower than the rock. Why? No. Okay. Why? Why? Why this way? Because the Jew does not have an ap- option of going up and down in creation. And Rav Dessler ra- writes in Mikhtab Me'eliyahu, he writes, the Jew is unlike any other creation. Every one of the other creations... Once it leaves the world, can go down to a lower one, what, or it can increase, meaning that it could go up and down in creation. The Jew cannot. So, for example, the plant grows on top of the rock, on top of the ground, and the animal, the animal, the living, eats the plant in order to sustain itself, and the man eats the plant, now eats the animal on the plant. In order to sustain itself. But the Jew cannot be like this. If the Jew, that means that there's also a reverse possible as well. The Jew does not have this possibility. If the Jew is not a righteous Jew, it just simply ceases to exist. It doesn't become a non Jew. The Jew does not become a dover, a regular person. It doesn't become an animal. It doesn't become a plant. It doesn't become a rock. It becomes nothing. It becomes worse, worse, worse thing in the world. And that's why Kadosh Baruch Hu gives them such a high reward, but also such a high punishment. So, to answer the question directly, is the soul of a Jew and a non-Jew are not the same at all. They're a world apart. Just like there's a difference between the cow and the human being, there's a difference in the soul, in the spirituality of a righteous Jew and even a righteous non-Jew. Even if the non-Jew is righteous, he could be righteous, tzaddik, great, one chasdeh umot olam, perfect. But in comparison to a righteous Jew, they're a world apart. Their constant, their in- inevitable heaven is world apart, and so on and so forth. Same thing with punishment. Punishment is a world apart. But that also gives the non-Jew the ability to upgrade themselves, whereas the Jew cannot downgrade themselves. They can ruin themselves, but they can't downgrade themselves and still stay in existence. The non-Jew can become a Jew. 
The Jew can never become a non-Jew. They can act like one, but can never, they can never become a non-Jew. Can never take out the Judaism out of a Jew. So, as far as the mitzvot of Judaism, the mitzvot of the Torah, there are mitzvot for the Jews that are only for the Jews, and there are mitzvot for the non-Jews that even the Jews can fulfill. But nonetheless, there are mitzvot that only the non-Jews can fulfill and the Jews can't fulfill. Each one needs to focus on their own obligation and not try to piggyback off of the other. Unfortunately, what I'm seeing a lot today is that a lot of non-Jews like Judaism and they decide to live a half a Jewish life. Meaning they fulfill whatever mitzvot fit their, uh, fit their desire. And uh, whatever mitzvot they don't fit their desire, they don't do it. In essence, they're living a life that is like semi-Jewish without the conversion. This is a problem. Because if you don't have the right direction, you may not know that you're actually fulfilling certain mitzvot that you're not allowed to fulfill. There are certain mitzvot you're not allowed to fulfill. Even more so, there are certain mitzvot that would be considered as if you are creating your own religion. And if you create your own religion, whether it be Christianity, Islam, or your own ABC religion, because you took a few mitzvot from the Torah, you decide to adopt them into your life, even though you're not allowed to do them, it's a death penalty from heaven. So you think that you're going to get a reward for it, but in reality, you're getting a punishment for it. So for example, it's, I don't believe it's punishment, but nonetheless, a Jew is the only one that's allowed to say Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Why? Because it literally says, Hear, O Israel. This is specifically a verse of the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is talking to us directly. We're talking to Hashem directly. Which, by the way, anyone that read the Alon HaKodesh that we just published, saw my, uh, the Rabbanit's Chidush on Shema Yisrael. How come Shema Yisrael is a, uh, something that a person is supposed to say before they go to sleep and also before they die? The reason why is because the Rabbanit says that the Gemara in Masechet Brachot says that sleep is one sixtieth of death. Gemara says when you go to sleep, it's partial death. Your neshama, a big part of it, leaves. So it's partial death, which is also the reason why you say Modani. Thank you, Hashem, for bringing back my neshama. Why? Because in reality, you were dead. You were dead. And now you're alive again. And before you go to sleep, before you uh, before you go to sleep permanently, which means dying, you have to say Shema Yisrael. You have to try. Your best to remember constantly your whole life after Shish Ma'israel. Why? So there's many reasons the Chachamim say, and the Rabbanit says a fantastic chidush. He says, what are you really saying when you say Shema Yisrael? What are you really saying? Hear, O Israel, God is one. Am Yisrael, God. Am Yisrael, God. What does it mean, Am Yisrael, God? Kiruv, Am Yisrael, come back to God. Am Yisrael, stop going with the Goim. Stop acting like a Christian. Stop acting like an Arab. Stop acting like a Greek. Stop being like the Goim and be a Jew. Why? Because God is the only God. There's no other God. Not in your business, not in your home, not in your anything. It's only one God. Meaning that a Jew is not only supposed to remind himself that God is one, but he's also supposed to remind his brothers and sisters. And what beauty of a mitzvah to finish your life with. That you can go up to Shemaim and you're going to have all your mitzvot come with you. And you have one mitzvah to present to the Bet Din and Shemaim. And says, Hashem, look at this one. My last mitzvah on earth was what? Doing Kiruv. Helping Am Yisrael come back to you. That's a mitzvah that's going to defend you in Shemaim. That's a nice mitzvah. Why? You said Shemaim Yisrael. So the point is, Abutai, is that a person says Shemaim Yisrael, he is connecting to Hashem. But a Jew has to do it. Not a non-Jew. Why? Because this is a specific mitzvah for Jews. There are certain things that non-Jews can say. You are allowed to say Kaddish on a non-Jew. You're allowed to say Kaddish on a non-Jew. You're allowed to say Kaddish on somebody that's not your parent. In fact, some Chachamim are of the opinion that every Jew should do Kaddish every day. Even if it's not your parents. Even if it's not your brother or sister, you should do Kaddish every day. Meaning males. Guys, should should read Kaddish every day. Why? Because what are you doing with Kaddish? You're sanctifying Hashem's name. And if you're doing it for somebody that passed away, in essence, you're helping their neshama. You should do Kaddish all the time. You shouldn't just wait for your uh, somebody, a loved one to die. You should do Kaddish regardless. Some say, no, let's just focus on the ones that have their parents because, you know, for different reasons. But the point being is that you're allowed to say Kaddish for somebody that's your relative. You could say Kaddish for someone that's not relative. And you could even say Kaddish for someone 
that is a uh, not you know, that's not even Jewish. But as far as a non-Jew reading Kaddish, who is he reading it to? He can't go to shul if he's not Jewish. He can't go to shul because he's not. It's not what. It's not his. It's not his obligation. He wants to pray on his own. He wants to pray on his own at home or with a group of people. There's no problem with it. But the ideal way to pray for non-Jews is your own words. Why? Because the seder, the, the structure of tefillah, is part of Judaism. It's not part of the rules of the rest of the world. So even though there are some smart people that decided to create a book for non-Jews to follow some type of structure for prayer, this was not dat chachamim. This is not the opinion of the sages. You don't see any Rishon or you know any anyone in the time of the Rambam or Rashi or the Gemara that wrote a Sidu for Goin. It's not that they dislike Goin. It's just simply they don't need it. They can pray better with their own words. What's happening? What's happening is that a lot of people are discovering Judaism because of the internet. Baruch Hashem, Kadosh Baruch Hu, is spreading Judaism all over the world in order to reach these special Neshamot that want to become Jews. But some people are spiritually lazy and they want to convert without conversion. They want to keep whatever they feel like it. So they start creating their own version, their own religion. And unfortunately, of course, there's always somebody that calls himself a rabbi that's going to appease them and enable them to do things that are not for God, that are against God, and tell them to keep Shabbat, even though Torah says not to keep Shabbat if you're not Jewish. The Rambam says that a goy that keeps Shabbat is death penalty in heaven. So they think they're going to go to heaven with a, with a reward, they're going to get a uh, penalty for it. And the reason why is because when you keep Shabbat, you are stealing the present that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Am Yisrael. And for stealing, for a Jew that steals, he has to return double. For a Goy that steals, it's death penalty. So, when all of these people are doing mitzvot that do not belong to them, they're making a mistake. That's why there is actually a uh, section of Yalkut Yosef that's not sold with a set. I would recommend it for all not Jews to uh, to read it for themselves. The the Rishon Letzion, Rav Yitzchak Yosef, the uh, son of Rav Vadya, just put out a book in English, probably in the last year. Part of Yalkut Yosef that is uh, specifically for non-Jews. It's all the halachot for non-Jews. You want to know how to be a righteous non-Jew? Read that. Learn how, even though we, they invested time and effort into the non-Jewish world. You don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to go by the, uh, the, this uh, guy, uh, David something, and he wrote The World of the Gare, complete full of kfirah. Or other people that wrote all types of books that there's no real dot to in it. It's their dot. It's their opinion. You have to make sure that you're going to stick with that Torah. You have to go to the Chachamim. Why? Because if you follow Torah good, you'll have eternal payment. If not, Hashem Yerachim. Go ahead, you have a question. Yes. Oh, yeah. um, what do you do with Gretchen? Though? Someone that doesn't need Somebody like this, you send him this you. And tell him, listen, if you don't want to watch the whole two hours, three hours of it, watch the last uh, 20 minutes. So I get them the book? Well, you can get them the book, but you probably should get them the lecture first. I have several lectures for non-Jews on the internet, um, and uh, you could send a, you could send me a text. I'll send them to you about why non-Jews are not allowed to keep Shabbat. I deal with a lot of non-Jews, and I help a lot of them. Baruch Hashem, I think they're fantastic people. And some of the uh, best supporters of Am Yisrael are non-Jews, righteous non-Jews, not talking about Christians. Can you please stop? Please, you're distracting the whole time. Please, stop. Chalas, stop interrupting. You're interrupting. You're, you haven't stopped interrupting since the minute you came in here. Please stop. So, they can go to the store and buy. This is not a store. Yes, go to the store and buy. You're doing Chilul Hashem, which is worse than Din, my friend. It's worse than Din. Din is Chilul Hashem, that you're desecrating the Torah by, by interrupting the lecture. Why do you come? Why do you come? Why do you, every show you come, you interrupt? Don't come, please. Do me a favor. Every show does not stop bothering. Come on, you're interrupting. The whole time you're talking to him, he can't listen to five minutes already, you're bothering him. Then the people, then this. All of a sudden, you're volunteering other people's property. 
Who said to give people's water? He thinks he's doing a mitzvah. Mitzvah from the Satan. This is a mitzvah you don't learn from. You're giving other people's property to somebody else. Who said to give it to them? Where did you learn Torah? What are you doing? What's the matter with you? You, 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 you. You have to stop. Stop what? Stop what? What do I do? I give him water? You it's your water? Him? Not to give him your... No, it's not your water. Why you just so stole. Why you so because you are interrupting a shiur Torah. Okay. Chavod. Chavod. The shiur Torah has to stop for you constantly. Okay, anybody, any more questions? Yeah, yes. Two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, we see that the Goyim respect the Jews when the Jews behave. Ken. Why are the Goyim going to go against the Mashiach and the Jewish people at that point? Because not all the Goyim are going to jump, for, uh, jump on board. Many of the Goyim are going to go against the Torah, like they are right now. They're promoting idolatry, they're promoting stealing, they're promoting promiscuity, they're promoting all the things that are against the Torah. The majority of them are not righteous. There are a few that are righteous, but most of them are not righteous. So the few that are righteous will be saved. The majority that are not righteous will be destroyed. Bezat Hashem. Oh, yeah. And the second question was, uh, uh, the Jews are going to go against the Can you please leave? Can you please leave? Can you please leave? Ali, can you please leave? Can you please leave? You are distracting everyone here. It's coming to learn Torah. You are distracting. You are distracting. Okay, go to Gainom with all the people that believe it. Go, please. the person that has this true believes it. He doesn't. Okay, said that. He told me today. Can he told you today? Please, can you please go? Can you please go? You, you tell people to go to hell. Can you please go? No, I'm telling you to leave. Just telling you to leave. Can you just please go? Because I pay for the place. I don't want you to be here. I pay. Cash. Yes, I pay. You call me now. No, I pay him. Go, please leave. You are distracting everyone else here. Please leave. Please leave. Please leave. Bezat Hashem, you never come. Bezat Hashem, you never come. I, please, just chalas. You are distracting. You're distracting everybody else. Everybody else cannot learn with you. Be here. Any more questions that are actually. Uh, what to what? Oh, I'm sorry, he distracted me. Uh, what? Are we going to be stuck wherever we are, or we just sort of keep going higher and higher when the Shia comes? Well, you're, you're yes or no. Certain, your your bad midot will stay with you. Your knowledge of Torah will increase. So yes or no? If somebody leaves this world with a filthy mouth, a filthy ideology, they have a very serious problem because that. Stays with them. For example, when uh, Rabbi Yudaftaya, Allah wa Shalom, they uh, spoke to the dead, different people that were dibukim, it's called. They go, the spirits that go into different bodies that are living. And uh, he saw that people were constantly cursing. And he asked them, how come you're still cursing even though it's not allowed in the Torah? And you're in the world of truth. How could you still curse knowing that it's not allowed and you're surrounded by truth? He says, it's, a, it's, it's not even a, uh, something that I can control anymore. I died with a filthy mouth, and therefore I'm going to have a filthy mouth permanently. So there are the bad character traits like rudeness and disgusting behavior and things like we saw tonight in this you from this person, and every time we see him. That is, unless they do tshuva, that doesn't go away. But things that are uh, good, for example, if a, uh, somebody has good midot, somebody has Torah, that can increase, that can improve. But nonetheless, a person needs to know that it's not a picnic. Hashem is not going to do the work for you. Meaning, if you are only going to learn Torah like a first grader for the rest of your life, then you're not going to be able to learn with Rabbi Akiva and Shemaim. Why? You have nothing to do with him. But if you toil and you work hard, like Rabbi Akiva did, 
You can learn with Rabbi Akiva. It's not a matter of how much you achieve. It's a matter of how much you try. How much you try to do tshuva. If you're spiritually lazy, no power in the world can help you. Other than yourself. If you're going to try your best, to do your best, to control yourself, to improve your, uh, your, your status and, and your knowledge and so on and so forth, then you will only benefit in this world and the next. But in essence, the uh, Mashiach is not the only time that a person should consider these things because no one is guaranteed tomorrow. If a person dies, that's no different than Mashiach because Judgment Day is right there and then. And uh, unfortunately, what most people don't realize is that judgment day can happen in any day. Like it happened to somebody that I know uh, just a few days ago, and a few people that I know a week ago, and a lot of people that, oh Hashem, you know, meet their maker, you know, sooner than they thought. You know, a person needs to know that, you know, all the chilul Hashem, and all the desecration of Hashem's name, and all the sins that they have to, you know, they're not going to have all the time in the world to fix it. They have to fix it sooner. And when a person doesn't take this into account and acts like an animal, Eventually, they're going to have to pay for it. It's not about being a dean. It's just this is, this is what it says in the Torah. Yes? You mentioned how suffering doesn't really carry the day. So why don't we pray for suffering? Why don't we pray for suffering? Because you get it anyway. And we're not, you get suffering regardless. Most of life is suffering. The vast majority of people suffer throughout most of their day regardless. You wake up early not because you like waking up early. You wake up early because... You have to do something that you don't really feel like doing if you had the option, but you have to go and work. You have to go make money. And you don't really feel like working. You don't feel like going to make money. You, if you were up to you, you just sit on the beach all day. But most of what we do is suffering. We eat certain foods because we don't want to get sick. We uh, do a lot of different things that we do, and to us, it's suffering. Uh, we have problems, financial issues, marriage issues, child, children issues. Uh, in essence, life is full of suffering. It doesn't mean that life is bad. It just means that life is constantly a uh, mission for you to overcome different obstacles in order for you to soften your character, in order for you to become less materialistic, less dependent on the physical world, and more connected to the spiritual world. This is part of the reason of why we fast several times a year, not just on Yom Kippur, but also on Tisha B'Av, and different times during the year. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you to designate several days a year to lower your dependence on physicality, on, on the materialism of the world, and even on the uh, benefits of materialism in the world. Why? Because this, when you're not connected to material, when you're not connected to material, this leaves some type of empty space, if you will. So Hashem says, use that empty space to connect to me. Get that same satiation. That same satisfaction by praying to me, by learning, and so on and so forth. And that's why many Chachamim, they do something called Tani Dibu. Tani Dibu is a fast of speaking. They don't speak for several hours either every day or throughout the whole week, depending on the person, in order to, again, limit their satisfaction from the world, if you will. You're allowed to benefit from the world, but when a person wants to get to a higher level, they, in essence, disconnect from materialism. Now, the suffering that a person brings on himself has a lot of value, even more value than suffering that goes on to him without his will. Meaning if he has financial problems or health issues and so on and so forth. But if he elects to bring suffering on himself, it's much more valuable. The problem is, is that most people cannot even handle their own suffering that they're getting without asking for it, let alone asking for it. And the reason why I know this is because when was the last time that somebody got hurt and they said Baruch Hashem. You know, when a person gets hurt, for example, I remember that, uh, well, let's skip that actually. Uh, different times in my life, I had Baruch Hashem, lots of suffering. And um, the test, if you will, the test changed direction, changed direction once I understood that suffering has a value. Now, I didn't, I didn't ask for the suffering. I didn't ask for the pain. I didn't ask for the surgeons to investigate my body without anesthesia. I didn't ask a, uh, you know, the, the, uh, me to have the uh, screaming and yelling every single day, my lungs out, 24 hours a day for many, many years. I didn't ask for this. But the test changed once I understood that this suffering has a value. Why? Because now, instead of saying, ow, and every curse in the book... 
I would say, ow, but Baruch Hashem. Why Baruch Hashem? Because I know that this suffering is going to help me avoid much greater suffering that I can't even comprehend in a much, much different, more different world. So it helps a lot to understand that suffering has a value. It also gives a meaning to life. A lot of people that have, uh, Jacob, please leave, 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 Jacob, leave, leave, leave. I have to ask you three times or four times. Can you please both leave? For heaven's sake, can you please both leave? Somebody's asking you to leave. Okay, you know what? Sedam, you don't want to leave. Sedam. Jacob, leave. Because I said so. Leave, leave, Ribono Shirolam, Ishtabach Shimon Laad. Somebody's asking you to leave. Leave. That's what we call Chilul Hashem. Selfishness, desecration of the Torah, and practically every sin in the book, you could find a source for it from these two morons. A whole room of people has to stop learning Torah because they want to play with a phone and go back and forth and volunteer other people's stuff. And they think it's a mitzvah in the name of chasidut, in the name of somebody. I don't understand. Where do they learn Torah? From the the toilet room? The the, the bathroom? People have no midot whatsoever. They don't even know how to be human beings. Somebody tells you that leave, leave. Somebody tells you stay, stay. Somebody tells you, I just don't understand how difficult this is. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what's going on with people. I'm not really sure what's going on with people. With the, I feel like this, these shuim are for a waste of time. A much a waste of time. If this is how the world is, this is how people are going to behave regardless, what's the point of teaching? Just give me a cave. I'll go to the, the, the cave, leave, lock the cave once and for all. That's it. Everybody goes to Ghana, don't get a gnome. What's the point of teaching if people are going to stay animals? What's the point? What's the point? Two years the kid's coming to a shoe, hasn't learned a single thing. If that's not enough, this, this other guy comes and interacts. And, and, and the whole shoe, I'm watching both of them. And not only they're interacting, it's right in front of me. It's the first row. It's like you don't even have enough bouchard, enough, 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 enough uh, embarrassment to do it in the back of the room. Right, first row. The whole time they're playing with the phone. The whole time going back and forth, getting up, getting down, getting up, getting down. Even animals don't have such behavior. I used to have a dog 16 years. When I used to first start doing giving shulim, he sat quiet the whole time. You see it in the shulim. Sometimes you hear some uh, a bark because he wanted to go outside. So I asked him, the original shulim from five, six years ago, some, once in a blue moon you hear a bark. And I would tell somebody from the shulim, do me a favor, open the uh, door. So you go outside and uh, take care of his business. But he was there for two hours quiet. The dog. The dog was quiet. But the human beings can't be quiet. What's the point? If this is what we're at, I can't help people like this. If this is where we're at in the world today, you cannot, I mean, the, mamash, no busha, no kavod, no nothing. Forget about me. For you people. Not even enough decency to just say, you know what, I'm, I must be bothering other people. There's other people in the room. I must be bothering them because they're here to listen to the shoe at 11, 12 o'clock at night. Not to see me with my uh, uh, you know, clothes that look like I found in a garbage pail and my behavior that's also from the garbage pail. But this is, if this is what the world has come to, Rabotai, if we're going to stay the same, please tell me. If no one here wants to do tshuva, everybody's going to stay the same, tell me. I'll save myself the time. I suffer anyway. I suffer anyway. Only people that see my house know how much I suffer every day. All day, every day I suffer. It's much a miracle that I'm here. You guys have no idea how much I suffer every day. The amount of pain that I have to go to physically every day to make it here is going to make your, your, your life seem like Gan Eden. Gan Eden, the amount of suffering that I have to go to just to make it here. Just to make it. I look like a, a lion in front of you guys. I scream, I yell, I feel like I look like a million bucks. The second the shoe is over, the second I get home, I go back to suffering. The amount of suffering that I have to deal with just to get here is, is in, enormous. 
It still makes my past like Gan Eden. But the amount of suffering that I have to go through just to get here, the, 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 it's unimaginable. The least you can do is, is just listen, take into account. You want to listen, don't listen. But <laughs> don't disrespect the rest of the people that are trying to listen. Don't disrespect the rest of the people that are trying to do tshuva, trying to fix themselves. People act like animals. For what? Go to the zoo. Go to the zoo and act like an animal. What do you need to act like an animal here? If you, you found, you lost all the places in the world. What, the Florida Zoo is not welcoming anybody at 10 o'clock at night? The homeless shelter is not welcoming anybody at night? The church is not welcoming anybody at night? I don't understand. People have zero, zero ability to just comprehend what damage they cause other people. And instead of being quiet, he's trying to egg me on, trying to make me angry. What angry? You think I'm going to be angry at some fly? It's just chaval, chaval, we're losing Torah time. We're losing Torah time. There's Baruch Hashem, a few new people that want to learn Torah, want to change their life. Instead, they have to look at an embarrassment of Judaism because they're wearing a kippah. By the way, guys, that's not Judaism, just so you know. I don't care what, how many tzitziot. You can have 500 tzitziot. That's not Judaism. That's not Judaism. Don't ever think for a second that's a version of Judaism. That's not even reformers like that. Even the reformed people have more respect for each other. Even the Christians have more respect for each other. You're never going to see, go to a church, and you're going to see people do this. Never. Why? They'll crucify him, not right next to their fake God. If you speak in church, they'll crucify you right next to Maria, right next to Jesus, right next to all the other uh, idols they have over there. Crucify what? what? Not allowed. It's just simple, simple manners. Simple manners. If we're not going to have simple manners, for what do we have this shoe for? For what? Why? You, got, you, you think you're going to get me to because you keep Shabbat? You think you get, you're going to get Gan Eden because you keep kosher? Hashem doesn't need your kosher. Doesn't need your Shabbat. The whole point of all of the mitzvot, as the Gaon Mivrina says, is to fix you as a human being. Fix you as a human being. If you're not going to be fixed as a human being, it's all garbage. You could do every mitzvah in the, under the sun. You don't become a decent human being according to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's definition. It's all waste. Gaon Mivrina says, for what did you live? For what did you live? The mitzvot are supposed to soften you, make you a better person. But instead of being a better person, where you say, oh no, you are this and you are that. He starts arguing with me like uh, we're having a debate. Or he starts giving away stuff that doesn't belong to him. Mamash, busha v'chirpav. This is this, Rabotai. Please, please, don't ever think that's Judaism. This is the Chilul Hashem we're fighting against all our life. This is what we're fighting against. That's the enemy. That's the desecration of the Torah. That's Gehazi. Torah has a story about the prophet Elisha. Elisha Navi. Elisha, his rabbi, was Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi, Zachul Etov, never died. You see it in the Tanakh that when it was time for him to go, HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't kill him. What did he do? He took a wind and a chariot brought him up to heaven. He turned him into a malach. Turned him into a Angel and Elisha, his student, took over as the prophet of the generation. Elisha was Kodesh Kodeshim. And one time a goy contacts Elisha saying that uh, he wants him to heal him. And Elisha told him to go to the river and dip in the river. And the king thought that he was making fun of him. So he didn't want to go until his servant said, listen, you already tried every other medicine. You already tried all the other, you know, wise people of the other nations. Why don't you try the wise people or the person of the Jews? If he's already here, might as well go to the river. What's the big deal? He went to the river. And as he went into the river, everybody saw him naked. And his whole body was full of disease. His whole body was full, full of, a, of a disease called sarat. And everybody was like, you know, like, you know, when you see something disgusting, you're taking back. When you see something painful, you're taking back. Combine both of them, multiply by a thousand. That's what he had. Awful, awful disease that's both spiritual and physical at the same time. Amash, gain in this world. So they saw him take off his clothes. 
they saw all of his servants were like taken back. He went into the water. He got up out of the water. And everybody sees him like a baby. This is gone. Completely gone. Biki du Shashem. Biki du Shem. He goes back to Elisha Navi. Says, thank you very much. Now I know that you're a man of God. I want to convert my, myself and my whole nation. I want to become Jews. I want to become Ami Sayyid. Become part of this is the type of strength that your God has. I want to become a Jew and I'll convert my entire nation. Elisha said, welcome. Welcome. She said, oh, I'm a king. I'm rich. Let me give you something. Elisha said, no. We don't take any money. We do what we do because it's Hashem's will. We're not taking any money for it. We told you the cure because HaKadosh Baruch gave us the nevoa to do it and we did it. Not because you're going to pay us nothing. We don't want anything from you, in fact. He said, even more impressed. You did all this, not even for kavod, not even for honor, not even for money. Not, like, there's really no reason for you to do this. It's even more impressive. I'm converting my whole people to you. Tam Yisrael. Chazak He leaves. Do, 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 do. He starts walking half a mile away. All of a sudden, the servant of Elisha catches up to him. A guy by the name of Gehazi. Now, Gehazi wasn't a fool. Gehazi was Tamit Chacham. Gehazi had a beard, reached the floor. Strymol, everything. He had a Hasid. Hasid, Hasid. You know how many Shuat Torah Gehazi used to do? Gehazi used to teach Torah. What? His rabbi is the prophet. When the rabbi is not giving a shoe, who's giving a shoe? Gehazi is giving a shoe. It's not like just some nobody, some homeless guy with a, uh, with a uh, hump. No, Gehazi was Tamit Chacham. Gehazi had a lot of Torah in him. His, pro- his rabbi is the Gdol Adol prophet. Do you know how much Torah he knew? You combine all of the world's Torah today, he knew more than them. That's how much Torah he knew. But the Gemara says, Gehazi, en lo chelek le'olam abba. Gehazi has no share of the world to come. Where is he now? He's in Gehenom and I'll never leave. Why? Because Gehazi liked money a little bit. Just a little bit. He had a little chedak, a little germ for money. So he chased this king, caught up to him. Hey, listen. My rabbi, Elisha, he's kadosh, he's holy. He's too holy to say yes when you offer him some money. But between you and me, he's so humble, he's so pure, he's so good. He's not going to say yes. But really, he should, you should give him something. You should give him a few suits, a few nice suits, a few nice things. You're a big deal. King says, of course, give him suits, give him a few, no problem. But in his mind, he said, of course, no problem. But in his mind, the value of Elisha, the value of Am Yisrael, the value of Torah, and the value of Akadosh Baruch Hu himself just dropped down. Why? Because now it has a price. Your God has a price. Your people have a price. Your Torah has a price. Your prophet has a price. Your rabbi has a price. Once he has a price, ah, I can pay for it. I can buy it. So you know what? I'll just be a Noahide. I'm not going to convert. Still righteous, but I'm not going to convert. When Elisha saw Gehazi come back, he told him, what would you do? He told him, well, actually, he knew it already from prophecy. Elisha and Avi said the curse that was on him will be on you and all of your descendants and your suffering will never end his own rabbi cursed them to no end why look how many lives you destroyed by this Chilul Hashem this guy would have converted every single second of his life would have been a mitzvah those mitzvot were gonna honor Hashem honoring Hashem is the only purpose of creation now he's not gonna do it that's God. His wife would have converted too. How many of what you're going to do? Honor Hashem. That's gone. The kids, gone. The grandkids, gone. The great grandkids, gone. The descendants of the grandkids, the descendants of the nation. Look how many mitzvot and opportunities to sanctify Hashem's name at the highest level possible are now missing. Why? Because you wanted to interrupt. Because you wanted to tell people your opinion. Because you wanted to eh, get involved, be interactive. 
Give your own peace of mind, even though it was not asked for. So Elisha says, you caused such a desecration to Hashem's name, and just like the greatness will never cease to, it will never come to the world, the suffering will never end either. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, His good, His mercy, is extraordinary, beyond our imagination, but so is His wrath. It comes together. All of the people that want to ignore that part are just living an illusion. An illusion. All you got to know as far as see wrath, go watch the video I, I recommended to you guys about the Holocaust. Look at the millions of dead bodies on the floor of our brothers and sisters. If that's not wrath, what's wrath? Go to the hospice center, local hospice center, any hospice center, and just walk bed by bed. Bed by bed and just hear their screaming and yelling. Right before they die. Go, go. Oh no, better yet. You want to go to the cancer. Go to the cancer place. Go to the hospital. Go to the cancer unit. Just hear them get the chemo. Hear them get the chemo and suffer. Go to the people. Go to the ICU. I spent months and months in the ICU. I spent months in the ICU. Sometimes I want to check myself in again. Just to deal with the day. Go to the ICU. Go see how we scream really, really loud there from the pain. What do you think that is? What do you think, that's a bonus? What do you think, that's a present? It's pain, Rabotai. Wrath exists. Punishment exists. Yes, there's always something good that comes out of every bad, but it doesn't mean that the bad is not bad. It doesn't mean that Gainum doesn't exist. And people that want to live this imaginary life, we just pray for them to do tshuva, or that Hashem will judge them as a shoteh. As a crazy person. Because a crazy person is not obligated to fulfill the entire Torah. So, please. If you're going to support Kiruv, Chazaku Baruch. If you're going to publicize the Torah, Chazaku Baruch. If you're going to come listen to the Torah and learn, Chazaku Baruch. But if you're not going to do any of them, if you're not going to support it, if you're not going to publicize it, you're not going to learn it, you're not going to apply it to your life, please, do Am Yisrael a favor. Not me. Do Am Yisrael a favor. Don't come. Don't come. Don't say anything. Go do whatever it is that you do in the world. I don't know, go in the woods. Go in the park. Go play with the lions. Go play with fire. Go play in moving traffic for all I care. It makes no difference to me. I'm trying to help the people that want to help themselves. That's really what I'm trying to do. I'm sacrificing my life and my family's life to help people that want to help themselves. That's it. So at the very least, a person can do is don't interrupt. Don't get in the way. Why? There's already enough that's difficult. We don't need any more. And this also answers your questions. Why we don't ask for suffering? Because it already comes automatically, even in the middle of the shiur. So Be'ezrat Hashem, all of us learn something from this. Learn something that we have a goal in the world. We have an objective in the world. There's a way to do it. There's a way not to do it. I understand that everybody has an ego and everybody wants their time to shine, but this is not it. Here, we come here to learn, to do, and to change. Amen ve'amen.